Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. This is the Story Master and I am back with a part 20 of What If Serena Traveled With Ash From The Start. But before we start, let's do a little summary first. Ash had faced many obstacles in his journey. Now let's see how this will change if Serena traveled with Ash and friends. So now join Ash, Serena, Misty and Brock in their journey through the Kanto region battling trainers, befriending Pokemon and learn through on their journey to become a Pokemon master. Disclaimer. Heracross0122 is the author of this series, I just made the audio adaptation of it and yeah I have the permission of the author. Remember to like, subscribe after this video and make sure to share it with your friends. Now let's begin. Chapter 55. Indigo League ice and grass. The entire rock stadium is silent. Not because it's empty but because it is empty, it is still packed after the first afternoon match on the second day of the Indigo League. It is silent because after the heated battle between Ash Ketchum and Melissa Yoshiki, the fuchsia native asked the raven-haired boy on a date. Nearly a minute has passed and not a sound was being uttered, except a honey blonde girl stormed out of the stadium clearly angry, if looks could kill. Well folks, this a first for me. The announcer commentated, will the winner of the match, Ash Ketchum, be a different kind of winner with the offer laid in front of him? Taking a deep breath, Ash realized he couldn't remain silent for long. Man, this is going to be hard. It is probably even harder because of the hundreds of pairs of eyes on him. Hell, even the commentators are invested in this. Knowing he can only be honest, Ash took a step forward, towards Melissa Yoshiki. Melissa. Ash started, causing the shy girl to look at him. Seeing the pleading look in her eyes just made this even harder. Quote dot dot dot. I'm sorry Melissa but I can't go on a date with you. And it's a no from young Ketchum. The announcer commentated. The crowd booed as Melissa looked down as a couple of tears fell down her face. If there is one thing Ash felt like right now, it's a jerk. Look Melissa, you're a great person. And anyone will be lucky to date you. Ash explained, as the crowd quietened down. Melissa looked at him with watery eyes, hopeful being the main emotion Ash could make out. I really am sorry, but. I'm sorry. Ash couldn't bring himself to explain himself, especially in front of everyone and just walked out of the stadium looking down, would the truth just make Melissa hate Serena, or would it just make her feel worst? Pikachu jumped onto his trainer's shoulder while Ash walked away patting his trainer's back. The crowd just continued to boo the raven-haired boy. Man, this isn't what he expected the Indigo League to be like. Ash was surprised when he left the stadium to find Drake and Togepi. When Togepi first hatched he mistook Drake for Ash a little bit but soon learned that his daddy's brother wasn't as friendly or cuddly and for the most part would ignore Drake. What's up? Ash asked as he walked up to them. As soon as he was close enough, Togepi jumped onto his daddy, who was able to catch the young fairy type. Ash caught the baby Pokemon in time for Togepi to give him a big hug for the fairy type at least. Where are the others? They went to the Pokemon Center. Drake's sweat dropped. How come? Ash asked, as he returned the hug to Togepi. Serena. Drake replied. She needed some fresh air. Ash sighed at the tone of his brother's voice. He can guess what went down after what happened in the stadium. Hopeful he can reach Serena before she gets to Melissa. The two brothers and the two Pokemon set off for the Pokemon Center. On the walk back, Ash couldn't help but notice people looking at him like he was some sort of jerk, or like he was caught abusing his Pokemon. 
Guess a lot of people sympathize with a young girl who gets rejected. How he didn't want to hurt her. As soon as they arrived at the Pokemon Center, neither noticed Misty, Brock or Serena so they moved over to Nurse Joy. Ash took Primapase and Aerodactyl's Pokeball off his belt. Nurse Joy, can you take a look at my Pokemon please? Ash asked as he placed the two Pokeballs on the counter. I'd be happy to. Nurse Joy smiled as she picked them up. Ash did think about giving her Sand Slash but the professor mentioned that he has Ivysaur use Sleep Powder whenever he checks on the ground type, and he plans to send him back to the lab. Nurse Joy handed the two Pokeballs to Chansey. Ash was going to ask about his next round but since there are still a few rounds left today they won't have that information until later. Thank you. Ash replied before he looked over to the corridors. The professor is probably chatting to Gary seeing as Gary's match would have finished during Ash, so he can send Sandslash back later. He took a deep breath before deciding to look towards the rooms. Ash. Brock. Drake. Gary. Richie and Calum have been sharing a room, as have Serena, Leaf, Misty, Miet and Melissa. That will probably end up changing considering what happened. Releasing the breath, he was holding. Ash, Togepi, Pikachu and Drake walked off to the girls' room. Hopefully Ash can talk to Serena before she talks to Melissa. Ash has had enough of world-ending events with Mewtwo. As they walked down the corridor, Ash noticed Brock sat in front of the door to the girls' room. The Pokemon breeder is clearly exhausted, as the boys stood in front of him, he looked up to them with fear present in his eyes. Hey Brock. Ash greeted, lacking his usual enthusiasm. Serena in there. Brock answered the question with a nod as he stood up and stepped to the side. Toge Toge. Togepi questioned with a curious glance at his daddy. His daddy won that battle so shouldn't he be happy. Even if he did use that scary claw mon. Can you look after Togepi, Brock? Ash asked. Nothing against Drake, but he isn't exactly the type to look after a young Pokemon and Brock is one of very few people who isn't Ash that Togepi will settle with, who isn't Ash. Of course, Ash. Brock smiled as he picked up the young fairy type. Togepi looked at his daddy with, sad eyes, before Uncle Pikachu jumped down to Brock's side. While he wants to spend some time with his daddy, Uncle Pikachu is a good substitute and Togepi may be young but knows that he shouldn't see what will happen in there. Don't worry Togepi, I'll be back soon. Ash reassured. Misty is also in there, Ash. Brock informed. You might also want to activate your aura. Ash chuckled lightly at Brock's joke as he placed his hand on the handle. Taking a deep breath, the chuckle faded and Ash pushed down on the handle, entering the room. A few moments later Misty left the room and the door closed behind her. Walking around the plateau is Calum and Miette, hand in hand. Calum had the first match of the day the grass field, the couple just grabbed a bite to eat before going to find the others. Since Ash's battle was still ongoing when he left his Ninetales, Dodrio and Chesnot at the Pokemon Center, neither of them knew any of the battle outcomes. As they closed into the stadium and Pokemon Center area, the crowd started to pick up, but something caught their attention. Melissa was sat on a bench crying her eyes out with Leaf and Gary surrounding her. Leaf is sat next to the upset girl while Gary is stood a little to the side looking very out of place. While he isn't exactly the sensitive type, he doesn't really have anywhere better to be in kind of wants to impress Leaf. The couple approached them. Hey guys. Calum greeted trying to keep things normal, and not make things awkward. Melissa continued to cry while Leaf looked at them in a pleading way. Calum mouthed the question. What happened? Leaf shrugged her shoulders to say she didn't know. In truth, 
She watched Gary's battle and once that was over the set off to go and find the others. Whilst walking they found Melissa crying on the bench and have spent the last 10 minutes trying to calm her down. Miette frowned and kneeled down in front of Melissa. Using her hand to gently lift Melissa's face up, forcing the young girl to look her in the eyes. Melissa seemed surprised to see four people surrounding her, almost like she never even noticed their arrival. Hey Melissa, Miette asked in a calm and comforting way. Melissa did her best to stop her tears and used her sleeves to dry her eyes, although the water was quickly replaced. Miette offered her a sympathetic look. What's the matter? A after the battle. With Ash. Melissa chalked as tears began to fall down her cheeks again. You lost. Gary stepped forward nodding his head, with his eyes closed in a calm demeanor. It's understandable but you were gonna lose at some point and at least it was against Ashy Boy and not some jerk. Like you. Calum whispered. Gary opened his eyes to discover Miette and Leaf glaring at him as Melissa had recovered her face as more tears started to flow out of her eyes. Needless to say, a sweat drop formed on the back of his head, he may be nicer that doesn't mean he is good at it. I'm just gonna wait over here. Gary sheepishly replied as he pointed to a nearby screen showing a battle, which happened to be Richie's. You do that. Calum encouraged. He too isn't the best when it comes to sympathy, but he at least knows how to not to do what Gary just did. Gary walked over to the screen, leaving the three to deal with Melissa. Calum also decided to take a back seat. Melissa, don't listen to what Gary said. Leaf comforted. There is no reason why you should be like this. Leaf is right. Why don't you just calm down and explain it to us? Miette added. Please. Melissa forced herself to stop her crying. I. Did L lose the battle EB but that isn't why why I'm you upset. Melissa explained. Stuttering. Then why are you upset? Leaf asked in a comforting manner. A. After the battle. Melissa continued. I. I. Asked Ash to go out with me. A and Leaf's eyes shot open at the revaluation, Melissa asked Ash out. Well, it is clear what his answer was if she is like this. Not to mention she is practically his twin sister considering how alike they are, so she knows he would never cheat on Serena. As bad as she feels for Melissa, she can't help but think about how Ash is feeling. Even though he wouldn't cheat on Serena, that doesn't mean he won't feel bad about turning Melissa down. Melissa. Miette spoke sympathetically. I know Ash wouldn't turn you down because of no reason. Did he tell you why he said no? No. He just said sorry then left. Melissa cried. It's probably because he hates how I look, or thinks I'm weird, or... No Melissa. Ash wouldn't think like that about anybody. Leaf asserted. She's right Melissa. Miette added. The truth is, he is already dating Serena. He only turned you down because he wants to stay loyal to his girlfriend. Are really? Melissa asked. Scared. The two girls answered with a nod of the head. Melissa went pale, like she just saw a ghost type. What have I done? They are going to hate me. And I did it in front of everyone as well. What do you mean, in front of everyone? Calum asked. Gary was now stood by his side seeing as Richie's battle finished with Richie as the victor. I, um, asked Ash out on the battlefield. In front of the stadium. Melissa admitted. Shyly, it must have been horrible for him to be put on the spot and have all of them look at him. I hope it won't cause him any trouble. Calum and Gary looked at each other. After a moment, the two boys tried to hold in their laughter. For as bad as it would be to be put on the spot in front of everyone like that, they can't help but laugh at the thought of Ash in that situation. They will be sure to check it out on the league highlights tonight. 
Leaf and Miette glared at the two boys, whose laughter was replaced with sweat drops. Now isn't the time or place for Ash's embarrassment. He should be present when they get their good laugh. The two girls turned back to Melissa. Come on Melissa, we should get inside. It's getting cold out, Leaf suggested. Melissa nodded and stood up with Miette and Leaf. B but I don't want to see Ash or Serena. Melissa exclaimed in a panicked tone. You know Melissa, they won't be angry. Leaf informed. They will understand that you didn't mean any damage. I I get that, Melissa replied. I'm just not ready to face them. That's okay, Melissa. If you want anything from your things, then we can get them for you. Miette offered. Thank you. I think I should get a new room. Melissa replied. Could you help me get my things? Of course. Miette smiled before she turned to the two boys. Go on. You can get her stuff. But. Calum tried to argue. We are going to help Melissa find a new room. Now go. Miette cut her boyfriend off. Calum knew that tone all too well. While it seems friendly, he knows that it isn't. The two boys groaned and slumped away to the Pokemon Center where they are all staying. The trio of girls walked off towards a different Pokemon Center. As sure as Leaf and Miet are about Ash and Serena forgiving Melissa, they have to agree that it is probably best that she moves to a new room. The next day, Ash is at the Ice Stadium ready for his third round battle against Pete Pebbleman from Brock's hometown off Pewter City. Seeing as he doesn't have any ice types, Ash decided to go with Wartortle, Dragonair, Charizard, Ivysaur, Primeep, Haunter and Pikachu. While he would have liked to bring Pokemon like Muck or Tauros rather than ones who have already battled like Primeep and Haunter, but neither are suited for an ice field, seeing as Muck is a pile of sludge and Tauros would go sliding instead of charging around. In the stands are Serena, Misty and Brock. Unfortunately, the other boys are battling at this same time. Miette went to watch Calum and Leaf decided to watch Drake, while she hasn't admitted it. Serena discovered that her best friend has a small-ish crush on her boyfriend's twin brother. While she wishes her best friend luck, she also has a bad feeling that Gary might have a crush on Leaf. She has thought this since the Sylph Company, but Leaf has just dismissed it. If Serena is right, then it could lead to one thing. A love triangle. As Ash was waiting to walk up to the field he felt happy that he was able to calm Serena down. True, she was awfully clingy the rest of the day, but she did promise not to attack Melissa the next time she sees her. Truthfully, Ash felt horrible for turning Melissa down but what choice did he truly have? At least now he can focus on the battle. Ash heard his opponent's introduction, and a loud ish cheer come from the audience, it was the same amount as both himself and Melissa got yesterday. And in the red corner, the trainer who clearly treats his Pokemon better than he does girls. Ash Ketchum from Pallet Town. The announcer shouted as Ash walked out onto the field and climbed the red stand, with Pikachu on his shoulder. The crowd booed him. Guess they aren't happy about him turning Melissa down. Let's see if the red trainer can break his opponent like he did the last one's heart. That doesn't make him feel any better. The ref took his place. Looking across the field, Ash noticed it was a sheet of ice with ice spikes sticking up all around it. He is glad he didn't bring Muck as he would likely freeze to the floor and Tauros would probably injure himself if he tried charging around this field. This third round match between Pete Pebbleman and Ash Ketchum will take place on the ice field. The ref declared, each trainer will be allowed the use of three Pokemon, and can substitute at any time. No time limit is in play and the trainer who shall go first will be. The board with both trainers' faces on light up. 
The green light behind Pete and the red light behind Ash continued flashing, rotating between the two photos, eventually it stopped with Ash's picture lit up. Ash Ketchum. The ref continued. The battle will be over when all three Pokemon on one side is unable to battle. Ash gripped his first Pokeball. While he doesn't have any ice types, out of all his Pokemon he has one who will perform best out of those who haven't battled yet, and he might as well go for an early advantage. I choose you, Wartortle. Ash shouted as he released his pure water type. Upon entering the battlefield, Wartortle fell on his behind courtesy of the ice, but quickly stood back up and pulled his black glasses out of his shell, putting them on his face. Looks like Ash Ketchum's Wartortle is adding another cool layer with his eyewear. The announcer informed. Let's see if he can treat his Pokemon better than he did his second round opponent. Talk about the cold shoulder. Then all chose, Electrode. Go. Pete shouted as he released his electric type. The upside-down Pokeball appeared on the ice field, and narrowed his eyes at his target. Ash was tempted to return his water type because of the type disadvantage, but Wartortle entered a battle stance as well, so he clearly wanted to battle. Ash pulled out his Pokedex and scanned the electric type. Electrode the ball Pokemon. The final evolved form of Voltorb. Stores enormous amounts of electricity within its body and explodes with the slightest provocation. Extremely dangerous. And the green trainer has gone with Electrode, making sure to take the early type advantage. The announcer informed. Let's see if Electrode can zap some feeling into the red trainer. It is clear his second round opponent couldn't. Ash sweat dropped, is that the only thing the commentators will bring up? If only they knew why he turned Melissa down. Guess for now he should just focus on the battle and not focus on it, it doesn't matter who the crowd favorite is after all. Electrode vs Wartortle. Begin. The ref declared. Pete vs Ash P. I. Roll out. Pete shouted. Electrode did a slight jump into the air as the ball Pokemon started spinning. Hitting the ground, he started spinning. Landing on the ice again, Electrode started rolling towards Wartortle. Looking closely enough, you can see the ball Pokemon picking up speed thanks to the slippery surface. Dodge with rapid spin, Ash instructed. Wartortle nodded seriously before withdrawing into his shell. The water type's shell started spinning and as soon as it hit the field, started spinning away. Ash thought he had the advantage since Electrode probably wouldn't be able to turn properly on the field, but Pete had a different idea. Use the ice pillar and change direction. Pete instructed. Although the speed made it hard to tell, Electrode made some sort of reply to his trainer's instructions. The ball Pokemon hit an ice pillar, which redirected the electric type so he was on course and chasing Wartortle down. Ash saw that he had to act fast, seeing as Electrode was picking up more speed. That's it. Turn that rapid spin into a Euro ball. Ash shouted. Wartortle also seemed to make some sort of vocal reply, but nobody could really make it out. Wartortle slowed down considerably as a gray outline surrounded his shell, as Electrode closed in. It was too late for Pete to counter as Electrode rammed into the back of the shell, with the electric type coming worse off. Awesome Wartortle. Now follow up with Water Gun. Ash hollered. Wartortle jumped into the air, exiting his shell as he wore a confident smirk, who cares about the type advantage when you're as awesome as he is. Taking a deep breath, the water type fired a powerful jet out water out of his mouth. Electrode took the attack head on and was blasted into a wall, as the water just kept coming. Use that water, Electrode. Pete instructed. Thunder. Ash watched in horror, as it was too late. A powerful electric blast was released off the ball Pokemon, 
and was quickly conducted by the water gun. Traveling towards the source, the thunder hit Wartortle, causing him to cancel the water gun and cry out in pain. Ash acted quickly. Return for now, Wartortle. Ash shouted, as he recalled his water type. And the red trainer has recalled his Wartortle so he can fight later on. The announcer informed. Let's see if he can pull back a victory with his second Pokemon or is his hope lost, like his second round opponent. Thank you, Wartortle. Ash told the shrunken Pokeball before clipping it to his belt. He decided to just ignore the commentator's references to the situation with Melissa or the laughter from the audience. Thinking over his current Pokemon, Ivysaur and Dragonair are his only Pokemon with a type advantage but both have a weakness to ice, meaning they aren't the best suited for an ice field. Ultimately, Dragonair would be the best bet since she likes to battle in the air rather than on the ground so the field won't have a massive effect. Dragonair, I choose you. Ash shouted as he released his female dragon type. Upon entering the field, Dragonair extended her body towards the sky and let out a loud battle cry. Not so much as a show of power like Aerodactyl, Charizard and Gyarados but more so to show of the beauty the princess truly is. And the red trainer, Ash Ketchum has gone with one rare Dragonair. The announcer informed. Also, being the trainer of a powerful Aerodactyl, one has to wonder where the young trainer gets all these rare Pokemon. As both Pokemon entered a battle stance, Ash realized that he probably shouldn't start the battle like how Dragonair likes to start her battles with Rain Dance seeing as Electrode knows Thunder, which is guaranteed to hit in the rain. That doesn't matter, he knows Dragonair is strong enough to still win. Electrode vs Dragonair. Begin. The ref declared. Pete vs Ash P. 2. Start off with Thunder Wave, that should slow it down. Pete smirked. Ash remained calm as small sparks flew off Electrode towards Dragonair. Both Ash and Dragonair knew neither of them had anything to worry about. The electricity hit the Dragon type and caused Dragonair to become paralyzed. Ash still made no move about it. Now that Dragonair is paralyzed, go in for another rollout. Pete hollered. Electrode entered another rollout and shot towards the airborne Dragonair, who was still paralyzed. Using an ice pillar, Electrode rode up the ice pillar to become airborne and fly towards Dragonair. Pete was sure he had nothing to worry about seeing as Dragonair was paralyzed. Counter with Iron Tail, Ash shouted. Dragonair let out a battle cry as her shed skin ability activated, causing her to cure herself of the paralysis. Pete was shocked, as Dragonair coated her tail in metal and swung it over her head. The steel-type attack struck the rolling Electrode. Dragonair won the power battle and knocked Electrode into an ice pillar. Dragon Rage. Ash hollered. Dragonair roared again as her jewel glew brightly. Many people in the crowd marveled at Dragonair's beauty. Opening her mouth, a small orange ball can be spotted before it fired out like a beam which struck Electrode, and blasted him into the ice. Cracking the field, Electrode was in a small pool of water. Ash figured that the heat from Dragonair's attack must have melted the ice. And the ice field has been cracked. As the most unstable of the battlefields one has to wonder how the added water will affect the battle. The announcer commentated. And how will Electrode handle be being in water? I know you don't like it, Electrode, so we need to end this now. Pete told his electric type who nodded in agreement. Self-destructed. Electrode smirked whilst floating in the water as the ball Pokemon closed his eyes and his body glue white. Ash knew he had to act fast as that attack would cause some serious damage to Dragonair just because of its pure power. Escape to the sky and dodge it. Ash shouted in a panic. Like a bullet, Dragonair shot into the sky, but Electrode soon exploded. 
The explosion barely reached the dragon type who cried out in pain, and fell into the smoke cloud which was the battlefield. Everyone was on the edge of their seats, waiting for the results. As the smoke cleared, Electrode could be seen floating in an iced pool with swirls in its eyes and soot covering its body. Dragonair was lying on a small patch of ice of the original ice field which was still somehow intact. The small body of water now took up about 65% of the field. Electrode is unable to battle. This round goes to the red trainer, Ash Ketchum. The ref declared. And the first knockout of the match goes to Ash Ketchum. The announcer informed. But it caused both his Wartortle and Dragonair some serious damage. Can he recover and still pull off a victory or has he lost his chance, like his round 2 opponent? Dragonair. You okay to keep going? Ash asked as Pete returned his fallen electrode. Dragonair slivered up towards Ash and nudged his head a bit. Of course. The princess would never show someone affection, she is simply allowing Ash to pet her. Rubbing her head, Dragonair made it clear that this princess is going to protect her castle and not become a damsel in distress. And it looks like Red Trainer, Ash Ketchum is staying with his Dragonair. The announcer informed, can the green trainer, Pete Pebbleman counter this mighty dragon or will this be where the pebble sinks? I've got the perfect counter for that dragon. Pete declared as he gripped his next Pokeball. Go Cloyster. Ash pulled out his Pokedex and scanned his new opponent. Cloyster, the bivalve Pokemon. The final evolved form of Shelter. Cloyster is capable of swimming in the sea. It does so by swallowing water, then jetting it out toward the rear. This Pokemon shoots spikes from its shell using the same system. Ash looked at the water ice type as both Cloyster and Dragonair entered a battle stance. Dragonair still can't use her favorite move as that would put Cloyster in a better advantage over his already type advantage as well as being on an ice or water field. This is not going to be easy. And the green trainer made a smart move by taking both the type and field advantage. The announcer informed. But red trainer Ash Ketchum has proven to fight against the odds and be very successful whilst doing so. Cloyster vs Dragonair. Begin. The ref declared. Pete vs Ash P. 3. Thunder wave. Ash shouted. Dragonair extended up to the sky, letting out a loud cry as the jewel around her neck blew. Little sparks flew out of the jewel towards the water ice type which is currently motionless on the edge of the pool. Protect. Pete instructed. Cloyster's shell snapped shut as a protective barrier surrounded the bivalve Pokemon. The electric sparks hit the protective barrier, and they bounced off dispersing into nothing, leaving Cloyster unaffected. As the barrier faded, Cloyster opened up again before wobbling into the pool. Surf. Pete shouted. The water started shaking as waves began to pick up. Suddenly, Cloyster shot out of the water, on top off a giant wave. Ashes and Dragonair's eyes widened at the massive water type attack. They both knew that they couldn't go above, around or below it. The only option is through it. Dragon rush, and go straight through it. Ash shouted. Dragonair roared again as blue dragon type energy surrounded her whole body, even have yellow eyes appear over her actual eyes. Shooting off towards the wave, the blur burst straight through it. Dragonair stopped behind the wave, and with a roar the dragon type energy burst of Dragonair, and the wave also imploded. Shell smash. Pete shouted in a panic. Cloyster withdrew into his shell as he went flying since his surf wave was destroyed. The water ice type glue white before red cracks appeared around him, before he burst out of it, increasing both his speed and attack power, while weakening his defenses. Icicle Spear, Pete shouted. While reaching the maximum height from his surf being destroyed, 
several sharp icicles appeared around the bivalve Pokemon. Like a machine gun spewing bullets, Cloyster quickly launched the ice-type attacks at Dragonair, who wasn't quick enough to act. She was knocked into the icy water. Now Blizzard, Pete hollered, Dragonair, Ash shouted in a panic. Cloyster opened his shell, quickly followed by a powerful icy wind begin released. The blizzard struck the water with Dragonair still half in the liquid as it started to freeze over. As the blizzard ended, Dragonair was half frozen under the field, with the water frozen over, and her other head on the ice with swirls in her eyes. Dragonair is unable to battle. This round goes to the green trainer, Pete Pebbleman. The ref declared, and the red trainer has lost his mighty dragon. The announcer informed, as the crowd cheered. Can Ash Ketchum handle this lost round or has he been frozen over like his fallen Dragonair? Return Dragonair. Ash recalled his fallen female dragon. As he held the shrunken Ultra Ball in his hand, he frowned. Sorry Dragonair, I should have returned you when I saw he brought out Cloyster. And thanks for your hard work, it won't go to waste. Now who will catch him choose? The announcer asked rhetorically, will he go for a water-on-water -water match with his Wartortle or will he bring out his final card for this match? Who can I choose? Ash thought to himself. Wartortle might be able to defend against Cloyster's attacks, but after that shell smash, I doubt that he can win a power battle, especially after his battle with Electrode. Choose me. A voice appeared next to Ash. Ash genuinely thought it was a voice in his head. Choose me, before I unleash my thunderbolt on ya. Ash realized it wasn't a voice in his head, it was his starter by his feet. Looking down, Ash saw a fire in his eyes. You want to battle, Pikachu? Ash asked, dumbly. No, I want to start a conga line on the field. Pikachu replied sarcastically, of course, I want to battle. Ash smiled down at his partner. It doesn't matter what the commentators think or what the crowd thinks, as long as he has his friends and his Pokemon, they can think what they like about him, but he will still win this battle. Okay Pikachu, Ash replied, smiling at his electric partner before looking over the field with determination. Cloyster had landed on the newly ice-covered water, in a battle stance. He may be at a disadvantage because of Cloyster's state buffs, and the field may not be the best for the speedy Pokemon but they have pulled through worst. I choose you. Pikachu smiled as he jumped onto the icy field, entering a battle stance, while sparking his cheeks. And it looks like Ash Ketchum has gone for his electric type, Pikachu. The announcer informed, this little guy has been by Ketchum's side since entering the plateau, so now we get to see what he is made of. Can Pikachu pull of a shocking victory or will he get cold feet? All right, Ash is using Pikachu. Serena cheered, before she felt a Pokeball wiggle. Her Eevee let herself out, sitting on Serena's knee the normal type barked something to her boyfriend but her voice just seemed to be lost among the crowd. Cloyster vs Pikachu. Begin. The ref declared. Pete vs Ash P. I V. Start off with quick attack. Ash shouted. Like a bullet, Pikachu shot off as his body was covered in normal type energy. Ash smiled seeing the speed of his starter, even going back to the battle against his uncle for the Viridian Gym there is clear improvement in that short amount of time. Protect. Pete shouted, sound surprised probably due to Pikachu's speed. Cloyster's shell slammed shut, as a protective barrier appeared around him. The speedy little Pikachu hit the barrier and was deflected off. Landing on his feet, Pikachu was sent sliding back across the ice as he entered another battle stance and sparked his cheeks. Aurora Beam, Pete shouted. Cloyster reopened his shell and fired a multicolored ice beam towards Pikachu. 
Ash knew he had to get Pikachu off the ice as the slippery nature of this field means Pikachu is going to struggle to perform his normal dodges. Lucky Ash has a plan for that. Dodge with Iron Tail, Ash shouted. Pikachu coated his tail in metal as the Aurora Beam closed in. Pikachu preformed a handstand as his iron tail swung over his head. His tail hit the Aurora Beam making him shoot into the air, easily overpowering the ice-type attack. Thunderbolt! Ash shouted. As he went flying through the air, Pikachu spun around so he was facing the bivalve Pokemon as he reached his maximum height. Pikachu curled up as his cheeks sparked he released a powerful electric bolt out of his body towards the water ice type. Block with Blizzard! Pete shouted in a panic. Cloyster unleashed a powerful icy wind out of his shell. The two attacks struck each other and seemed to push against each other to win the power battle. After a couple of moments, the blizzard seemed to overpower Pikachu and push the electric attack back. Ash knew he had to act fast. Turn it to thunder and start spinning. Ash instructed. Pikachu nodded. After seeing red and blue in a practice battle while training for the league, both Ash and Pikachu saw a move red and his Raichu used to overpower blue's Arcanine. Despite trying to replicate it, they haven't been able to pull it off yet, but there is always a first time for everything. As he was falling into the blizzard, Pikachu started spinning as massive amounts of electricity were released from his body. The build-up power surrounded the electric mouse like some sort of armor. The electric barrier protected Pikachu as he fell through the blizzard. He was able to guide himself down the wind current and hit Cloyster head-on. It caused a sort of electric explosion around both Pokemon. Cloyster. Pikachu. Both trainers shouted respectively. When Red and his Raichu used it, the electricity only protected Raichu then he finished with a physical attack, but that was more like a bomb. What do you know? Ash and Pikachu handled element barrier. Red sounded impressed as he sat down next to Serena, Misty and Brock with Delia. Mr. and Mrs. Ketchum. Serena questioned. We've told you dear. Call us Red and Delia. Delia replied with a friendly smile. He he he, right. Serena blushed. Like Ash she isn't used to being able to be informal with adults, especially not her boyfriend's parents. Excuse me, but you said the element barrier. Brock interrupted. Isn't that one of the moves you used against Blue when you battled at the lab? Right. Any Pokemon can use it but it works best with smaller speedy Pokemon. Red explained. But it didn't look the same as when you used it. Misty pointed out. Well the electricity is just meant to be protective barrier then you strike with a physical attack. Red explained. But Pikachu released so much electricity, which meant that became the punch. It might cause a bit of recoil damage but Pikachu should be final. As the smoke cleared over the field, Pikachu could be made out on top of the fallen cloister in a victory pose. Hudaman, Pikachu asked, which caused Ash to sweat drop while the crowd half laughed and half cheered. Cloister is unable to battle. This round goes to the red trainer, Ash Ketchum. The ref declared, and Ash Ketchum wins another round. The announcer informed, followed by the crowd cheering. Now in the lead with 2 to 1 but both his Wartortle and Pikachu are battle-worn. Can the young trainer from Pallet handle this last challenge or like the field will it break apart? Pete returned his fallen bivalve Pokemon. Ah! Look at Pikachu! Delia cooed. What a great photo opportunity! She pulled out a small silver camera and started to frantically take pictures of Ash and Pikachu as they waited for Pete's final Pokemon. Go Arcanine! Pete shouted as he released his fire type. Despite facing a few in his journey, Ash decided to scan it anyway. Arcanine, the legendary Pokemon. The final evolved form of Growlithe. 
a Pokemon whose beauty is legendary in China. It is said to run gracefully and lightly, as if it were flying. Pikachu. Ash called out to his electric partner. Wanna keep going? Of course. Pikachu replied with a smirk. Crouching down he entered another battle stance and sparked his cheeks. Arcanine also entered another battle stance. Um, not to sound rude. Serena addressed her boyfriend's parents. But what are you doing here? We arrived at the plateau as Ash's battle started. After getting a hotel room, we found Drake on the way to the Pokemon Center after he won his third round battle, so we came to watch Ash's battle. Delia explained. We did tell him that we would be coming to see him and Drake compete. Red replied. Both saw the twins' first two battles and were impressed with some of the battles already. Although aren't particularly interested in bringing up the end of Ash's second round, as it is pretty obviously a sour note. Arcanine vs. Pikachu. Begin. The ref declared. Pete vs. Ash P. V. Quick attack. Ash shouted. Like a rocket, Pikachu shot off across the icy field, covered in normal type energy. Ash knew Pikachu liked to start with a barrage of speed attacks and that has worked out well so fast. Fire blast. Pete shouted. Despite Pikachu's speed, Arcanine was able to release the powerful fire type move, seconds before the quick attack hit. Pikachu easily avoided the attack and Arcanine was sent sliding back from the impact. The fire blast flew in a straight line, melting a strip of the field away. Ash clenched his fist as it limits Pikachu's moving room. Fire blast, again. Pete hollered. He must have realized the same thing that Pete did. Arcanine fired another fire blast. Pikachu was able to easily dodge it, while more of the field was melted. Ash knew he couldn't really let this come down to a power match as each Arcanine he's faced before have one thing in common, being powerful. Quick attack and get close, Pikachu. Ash instructed. Pikachu nodded. He remembered facing an Arcanine back at the Viridian Gym and knows he is unlikely to win a power battle. Jumping across the ice, Pikachu quickly closed in as Arcanine fired off another fire blast. Pikachu dodged it but landed on a small piece of ice which was now in the middle of a lake of water. Flamethrower. Pete shouted. Thunderbolt. Ash shouted. Ash knows that Pikachu is in a tight spot, literally. As both the fire and electricity collided in the middle off the field, Ash noticed that there are only two patches of ice left, the one Pikachu's on and the one Arcanine is on. While the attacks seem evenly matched, the flamethrower started to steady push the thunderbolt back. Pikachu. Ash shouted in a panic, as the two attacks closed in on the starter. In a panic, Pikachu jumped out of the way of the two attacks. The flamethrower shot forward as soon as the thunderbolt disappeared, the little platform Pikachu once stood on melted, and while Pikachu avoided the fire-type attack he landed in the water. You okay Pikachu? Ash asked his partner. Pikachu was floating in the water and was able to flash his trainer a thumbs up. While the pool is a little chilly, he has been swimming enough to be fine in the water, granted he isn't as fast as Wartortle or Gyarados in the water but he is still fine in the water. Not for long. Pete smirked. Fire blast. Arcanine fired a final fire blast out of his mouth towards the electric mouse Pokemon. Pikachu attempted to swim out of the way, but wasn't fast enough. The fire-type attack struck Pikachu and evaporated a bit of water, covering Pikachu in steam. When that faded, Pikachu was on his back with swirls in his eyes. Pikachu is unable to battle. This round goes to the green trainer, Pete Pebbleman. The ref declared. Splash. Ash jumped into the water, which shocked most of those watching except for those who knew him, mostly. Swimming across the field, 
He grabbed hold of his fallen starter and started swimming back to the edge of the battlefield. What is this? The red trainer has jumped into the battlefield to save his Pikachu. The announcer informed. I know he has been by his side since the start of this league, but this is a little, far isn't it? The crowd responded differently to his actions, as Ash ended up back on the red stand he wrapped his starter up in his jacket which he took off prior to jumping into the water. The crowd either cheered or awed at the sight of Ash's selfishness towards his electric mouse. Pikachu weakly opened his eyes, and weakly whispered a thank you before Ash lay him on the side of the stand. Oh, my little boy, I hope he doesn't catch a cold. Delia frowned. Seeing her son jump into a pool of water which would obviously be freezing seeing as it was created from the ice-type field. Evie looked upset at her boyfriend's fall, and Serena reassured her before being returned. Don't worry honey, Ash's aura can protect him from minor annoyances like the common cold. Remember, Red reassured. Delia hugged her husband and closed her eyes while she waited for the ref to make his call. Red returned the embrace and looked at the three stunned trainers. Really? Brock asked in a surprised voice, he was a breeder and if Aura could cure the common cold then that would be a marvelous breakthrough, he was understand shocked, so shocked that his voice barely reached a whisper. Red looked at the shocked breeder. No. Red shook his head and mouthed a response. The Pokemon breeder and the two girls now just looked confused, why would he say that if it wasn't true? Deciding to answer the unasked question, Red continued to mouth the next part. She just likes reassuring and the boys have been pretty lucky about getting sick. While it is true that aura can affect someone's health, that is a more difficult skill to learn. Right now, Ash's aura will only activate if absolutely necessary or if his emotions go to an extreme for some reason. Once he has been trained properly, then he will have a proper immunity to most virus and bugs. Just not the common cold for some reason. Thank you for all your hard work, Pikachu. I promise it won't go to waste. Ash smiled sadly to his starter. Now get a good rest and leave it up to me and Wartortle. Now both trainers are down to their last Pokemon. The announcer informed. But who will win? Pete Pebbleman and his formidable Arcanine or Ash Ketchum and his tough Wartortle? Ash gripped his Pokeball. Wartortle, I choose you. Ash shouted as he released his battle-worn water type. The turtle Pokemon landed in the icy water and noticeably shivered before he started doing a backstroke to warm up. Hey Wartortle, it's just you and me. Are you okay for another round? I'll happily show yellow up. Wartortle smirked. In his Pokeball he could make out the fact that this Arcanine beat yellow so now he can show his rival up, kind of like Pikachu did at the Viridian Gym. Arcanine vs. Wartortle. Begin. The ref declared. Pete vs. Ash P. V. Skull Bash. Ash shouted. Leaping out of the water, Wartortle was charging towards the legendary Pokemon, head first. As the momentum built up, power also built up around the pure water type. Ash was confident in his Wartortle's power. Extreme speed. Pete shouted. Disappearing off the ice platform, Arcanine shot forward and hit Wartortle head on. Wartortle was sent flying as Arcanine's foot hit the water, before he jumped back and landed back on the ice platform. Ash looked worried when he saw the fire type practically walked on water. Despite the type and field advantage, this wouldn't be easy. Water pulse. Ash shouted. Wartortle jumped back out of the water, with a water sphere forming between his hands. With a swift throw, the water type attack was hurled towards the fire type. Ash was hoping the side effect of confusion would also take place. Flamethrower on the water, Pete shouted. 
Firing a stream of blazing hot flames into the water caused a thick layer of mist to appear. The fire type became practically invisible as did the water pulse. Unable to make out what was happening, a few moments later had the fire type roar, clearing the mist away. It didn't even look like he was hit. That was clever. Red commented. What was? Misty asked. Arcanine surrounded the water pulse with mist which was absorbed the water vapor. Overweighing the attack would have made it crash into the field, harmless. Red explained. Well then, we will just use the field as well, dive underwater. Ash instructed. Ash had a plan, as he remembered two battles in particular. The first being when he caught Muck the day before his Celadon Gym battle and his first round match against Mandy, particularly when his Gyarados beat Exeggutor. He just feels sorry for the ref and those seated on the first few rows. You can't hide from us, Thunder Fang on the water. Pete hollered. Ash knew that attack would hit Wartortle since water conducts electricity, but he knows he can easily deal with the attack. Arcanine roared again as his fangs were covered in electricity, he prepared to thrust them into the water. Rapid spin. Ash hollered. But stay under water. Wartortle knew what Ash was planning and was happy to comply. He is always the one to be the center of attention and after the attention Gyarados got from that water tornado combo, he is happy to do his own version. Before the electrified fangs could hit the water, the ice platform and Arcanine was being swirled around as the whole field turned into a giant whirlpool. The Thunder Fang was cancelled as Arcanine attempted to stop himself from falling off his platform, grunting as he was hit by multiple water splashes. Both the referee and the crowd were also hit by water which was flying everywhere. Skull Bash while Arcanine is stranded. Ash instructed confidently. From within his shell, Wartortle could easily make out the fire type's location. Wartortle started spinning towards his opponent before exiting his shell before power started to build up around his skull. Blasting out of the water, right underneath the ice platform, Wartortle knocked Arcanine into the air as the platform crumbled into pieces, before the fire type also dropped into the water as well. Being dragged around by the whirlpool. Arcanine hold on. Pete pleaded as he desperately looked for some sort of counted. Finish it with Aqua Tail. Ash hollered. Wartortle smirked as he was reaching his maximum height from his last attack. Looking down he saw where the legendary Pokemon was and smiled as it was a sitting Psyduck. His tail was covered by water, as he spun it over his head. The attack struck Arcanine dead on, a critical hit. Arcanine was sent flying across the field, hitting the wall before slumping into the pool with swirls in his eyes. Arcanine is unable to battle. Meaning both this round and match goes to the red trainer, Ash Ketchum. The ref declared, looking slightly annoyed about being wet through. Part of Ash wondered if it was the same ref from his match with Mandy since they all look the same. The crowd cheered loudly. Ash returned his water turtle, who was gloating at his victory before picking up his Pikachu and leaving his stand. The crowd cheered at his kindness for his starter and he approached Pete at the edge of the field. The two trainers showed some great sportsmanship by shaking hands, before they left through their respective looker rooms. As he left the stadium with Pikachu wrapped up in his jacket, barely awake. He was surprised to find his parents with his friends, and Togepi in his mother's arms. Toge Toge. Togepi cheered happily to see his daddy return. Jumping from his grandmother's hands, he surprising landed on his daddy's shoulder although a faint blue light revealed that Togepi's granddaddy may have helped with the guidance. The young fairy type wasted no time in hugging his daddy's face. I'm happy to see you too, Togepi. But I need to carry Pikachu, so it might be safer if you travel with mum or Serena or someone. 
Ash told his youngest Pokemon. At least until I get him to Nurse Joy, along with Dragonair and Wartortle. Togepi tightened his grip best he could, since getting to this place, he has had hardly any time with his daddy. So, if Uncle Pikachu needs to take his normal position, then he can take Uncle Pikachu's on his daddy's shoulder. Ash got the message that Togepi had no intention of letting go. You know Ash, the Pokemon Center isn't far away. I'm sure Togepi will be fine. Serena suggested. She can still remember the horror the spike ball Pokemon turned out to be when Ash left him to face Damien. She is certainly happy to let Togepi make the decisions as she doesn't want to upset him again. Yeah Ash, I'll even have my aura keep him steady if you want. Red offered. Ash smiled and accepted the offer since he can't reliably keep the young fairy type with Pikachu in his hands. So, mum and dad, what are you doing here? Ash asked, surprised by their appearance. We told you and Drake we were coming to see you both compete. Delia replied, when we arrived, we found Drake who already won his third round battle so we came to watch your match, and catch the last part. But we have been watching both your other battles on TV. So. You've seen what happened on the rock field? Ash asked, looking down. Yeah Ash, but I wouldn't worry about. Red replied. Ash was shocked. Practically every joke or comment the commentators made in this match was about him turning Melissa down, and being the bad guy, how can he not worry about it? You don't need to worry because when you make it to the plateau battles, you will have the chance to explain because the top 8 trainers have special interviews beforehand. Well, if he does make it that far, then he will be sure to set the record straight. Then a thought occurred to him, both Gary and Drake are competing and while Gary will probably milk the limelight for all it's worth, but Drake isn't one for attention so that would probably be interesting to watch. Well, we should probably get to the center. Brock commented. We can continue this conversation there. Please, you just want to see Nurse Joy. Misty rolled her eyes in annoyance. Don't think I didn't notice you sending Rhyhorn back to the gym. Either way Misty, Brock is right. Ash replied. Pikachu and the others could use some rest. The others agreed and the group set off. That night time, Ash held up his Pokemon and collected his three Pokeballs. He chose to use Tauros, Ivysaur and Muck in his battle tomorrow since it is on the grass field and these three haven't battled yet. It is true that Charizard also hasn't battled but he got to take on Damien right before the league so this seems to be the fairest route. Once he ran through his plan with the trio, Pikachu and Togepi, he returned the three Pokemon before heading inside. Where he saw Gary, Leaf and Serena sat on a table, and Gary looked. Worried. While Drake was stood outside on the battlefield with his full team out, with Red and Delia by his side. Ash could also feel an unusual tension in the air. Wanting to know the cause of this, he made his way over to Serena, Leaf and Gary. Hey guys, what's up? Ash asked as he stood next to them. Gary looked up at Ash before quickly looking back down. Never has Ash seen Gary so scared. What has gotten into him? Gary found out about his match tomorrow, for the final round. Leaf explained. Who is it? Ash asked. Clearly whoever it is must be a strong trainer. Maybe it's someone who already won a league or something. Ash has heard his final round opponent, Jeanette Fisher is meant to be a popular and strong trainer. It's going to be the final match tomorrow, on the rock field. Serena explained. So, who is it against? Ash asked. Quote dot dot dot. Drake. Gary answered. After Ash discovered only Gary or Drake would make it to the plateau round he got an early night to be ready for his fourth round match. 
He is currently stood in the green stand with only Pikachu by his side and three Pokeballs attached to his belt. His opponent is a female a few years older than himself with long purple hair and wearing a kimono. When Jeanette appeared, the crowd went wild, showing she is clearly the favorite and even had her own cheering squad. In the stands are Serena, Leaf, Misty, Brock, and Delia. Calum and Richie are each in their own battles, while Red is helping Drake prepare for his battle against Gary. Seeing as Ash's aura is already unleashed, Red doesn't need to focus on him anymore and can finally give his other son some attention. The ref took his place on the field. The fourth round match between Ash Ketchum from Pallet Town and Jeanette Fisher from Akrutique City will take place on the grass field. The ref declared, each trainer will be allowed the use of three Pokemon, and can substitute at any time. No time limit is in play and the trainer who shall go first will be. The board with both trainers' faces on light up. The green light behind Ash and the red light behind Jeanette continued flashing, rotating between the two photos, eventually it stopped with Ash's picture lit up. Ash Ketchum. The ref continued. The battle will be over when all three Pokemon on one side is unable to battle. Ash gripped his first Pokeball. While he already decided on his three Pokemon, he knows the order in which he wants to use them. He has worked best by taking the early field advantage so far with Gyarados on the water field, while both Wartortle and Primeep were capable of winning on the ice and rock fields neither really has the upper hand. So, he is going to start with his best field advantage. He gripped his first Pokeball. I choose you, Ivysaur. Ash shouted as he released his Grass Poison type was released. As Ivysaur appeared on the field, he took a deep breath before seeming to relax in the environment and entering a battle stance. Being sure to take the early field advantage, green trainer Ash Ketchum has gone with his Ivysaur. The announcer informed. One has to wonder how many Pokemon this young trainer has, seeing as he hasn't reused any Pokemon since entering the league. Then I'll use one who will be sure to buzz you. Beedrill. Go. Jeanette shouted as she released her bug poison type. Although Ash has spent a lot of time with Serena's Beedrill, he still decided to scan it with his Pokedex. Beedrill. The Poison Bee Pokemon. The final evolved form of Weedle. Flies at high speeds and attacks with three stingers. One on its rear and one on each of its two forelegs. May appear in swarms. Ivysaur vs. Beedrill. Begin. The ref declared. Ash vs. Jeanette P. I. Sludge Bomb. Ash shouted to start off. Ivysaur tensed up as his plant seemed to sprout out of his back even more than it currently was. Like a cannon, it fired several purple toxic blobs of sludge fired out towards the poison bee Pokemon. Dodge with agility. Jeanette instructed. The bug poison type's wings started beating very fast, as he swiftly moved out of the way of with incredible speed. Ash could notice the annoyance build in his seed Pokemon since he uses to use speed but can't because of his evolution. Ash just hopes he can focus enough to beat Beedrill and prove he doesn't need speed to win. Twineedle. Jeanette hollered. Like a black and yellow bug zoomed across the battlefield like a blur, easily dodging the rest of the incoming sludge bombs. Appearing right in front of Ivysaur, he wounded his stingers back before thrusting them into Ivysaur's face, causing some major damage as Ivysaur went back. Beedrill prepared to use the attack again. Vine whip and restrain him. Ash shouted. Ivysaur nodded as he stood back up. Six vines shot out from the sides of Ivysaur's plant, and went straight towards the incoming bug poison type. As Beedrill thrusted his stingers at Ivysaur, they were tied together, stopping Beedrill in his tracks. Not bad. Jeanette praised. But not good enough, 
Break free with focus energy. Beedrill closed his eyes as lights appeared around him, raising his critical hit ratio and when they faded, Beedrill was able to break his stingers apart, and Ivysaur had to withdraw all his vines like a motor reaction. Beedrill buzzed threading at his opponent. Now use poison jab. Jeanette instructed. Beedrill wound one of his stingers back as it glue purple. With another powerful thrust, it struck Ivysaur in the head. Ivysaur was sent flying to right in front of Ash, and growled as he struggled to his feet. Both Ash and Jeanette could easily tell that Ivysaur wouldn't last much longer. We need to get some health back, Ivysaur. Ash told his grass poison type. Use leech seed. Ivysaur nodded in agreement as he pushed himself up to his feet while clearly in pain. A small brown seed appeared in the back of his plant, and like the sludge bomb before, shot out toward the poison bee Pokemon. Dodge and use fell stinger. Jeanette shouted. Beedrill swiftly flew up to Ivysaur, easily dodging the leech seed which landed somewhere in the grassy field, unnoticeable. As Beedrill flew past Ivysaur, Beedrill struck the seed Pokemon with his stinger. Ivysaur went flying and landed on the grass with swirls in his eyes. Beedrill had his attack power swiftly increased. Ivysaur is unable to battle. This round goes to the red trainer, Jeanette Fisher. The ref declared. Return Ivysaur, you did a good job. Ash returned his fallen grass poison type sadly. He knows he has a good counter Beedrill seeing as it has increased critical hit ratios but is also sad for Ivysaur as a loss to a speedy Pokemon is likely to set him back even further than he already is. And Jeanette Fisher not only takes the first round but is also able to power up her giant bug at the same time. The announcer informed. How will young Ketchum response? Will he use his powerful Aerodactyl or does he have another plan up his sleeve? Oh no. Serena gasped as she felt some tiny hands rub her arm. Looking towards them, she saw Togepi was trying to comfort her. The little fairy type may not understand how this whole battle thing works, but it sure is entertaining and he hates to see his daddy's partner upset, because then his daddy will be upset. Don't worry Serena, Ash has a knack for getting out of tight spots. Leaf reassured. Remember when we were nine and he accidentally had Blue's Blastoise flood the first lab? How exactly did any of you end up in that situation? Brock asked, as both himself and Misty Sweat dropped. He he he, let's just say Ash thought he could make it as an electrician and practiced when the professor was researching Blastoise and a special form of evolution with a colleague from Kalos. Delia laughed. Rigget. Misty rolled her eyes, overly exaggerated. Tauros, I choose you. Ash shouted as he released his normal type. The wild bull Pokemon landed on the grassy field, and stomped his front hoof showing he is ready to battle as Beedrill also entered a battle stance. And green trainer, Ash Ketchum has gone with his normal type Tauros. The announcer informed, can this wild bull charge through the battling brute beetle, that is Jeanette's Beedrill or will he be bugged out like Ivysaur? Tauros vs Beedrill, begin. The ref declared. Ash vs Jeanette P. 2. Poison jab. Jeanette shouted. Beedrill had his stinger glow purple as he powered up a poison jab attack. Still with incredible speed, the poison bee Pokemon shot towards the wild bull Pokemon. Ash wasn't worried as he had a good way to overpower that beetle, and he also isn't scared about Tauros taking a critical hit. Zen headbutt. Ash shouted. A blue ball of psychic energy appeared in between the normal type's horns, before the wild bull Pokemon charged straight towards the incoming bug poison type. Beedrill thrusted his stinger into Tauros, and Jeanette looked worried when the normal type smirked in response, before the psychic type attack struck Beedrill. While Tauros stood his ground, 
Beedrill was sent flying as he has less defensive capabilities. Beedrill landed on the ground and quickly tried to push himself up. Bulldoze. Ash hollered. While that move would normally lower Beedrill's speed, Tauros traded that secondary effect with a power boost thanks to his hidden ability sheer force. Tauros lifted his front hooves into the air before slamming them down, causing the field to shake violently. Jeanette frowned when she saw Beedrill cry out in pain, and she worked out that Tauros had sheer force. She also believes his regular ability is anger point because he didn't activate intimidation, which means she is scared about critting him. Endeavor. Jeanette shouted. Beedrill weakly struggled into the air, before flying towards the wild bull Pokemon. While Bulldoze didn't lower the Poison Bee Pokemon's speed, the damage he has received clearly taken its toll. Ash knew he couldn't let that attack hit Tauros or he would be in the same state as Beedrill. Dodge it and use Iron Head. Ash instructed. Tauros nodded, while he prefers head-on battles and taking his opponent's hits to prove his strength he also knows how risky that is and isn't going to put not only his league position but also the rest of the team's position. Tauros charged towards the incoming Beedrill as his head was coated in metal. At the last second, Tauros dodged the endeavor before slamming his head which also got a power boost in place of the flinch chance. Beedrill landed hard on the grassy field, clearly close to falling. All right Beedrill, return for now. Jeanette tried to recall her bug poison type. She maybe should have done this sooner but she didn't want the state boosts she got off to go to waste. Still, better to lose them than to lose Beedrill itself. Pursuit. Ash hollered. Tauros shot forward towards the bug poison type as the red light attempted to return it. Tauros slammed into the weakened Beedrill and sent it crashing into a wall, causing some massive damage. Beedrill fell onto the ground with swirls in his eyes. Tauros let out a battle cry to show his power. Beedrill is unable to battle. This round goes to the green trainer, Ash Ketchum. The ref declared. Awesome Tauros. Ash praised. Keep up the good work. Tauros stomped the ground and let out a victory cry. Ash knows Tauros well enough to know he wouldn't accept it being switched out before he falls, kind of like his Pidgeot. Guess his two normal types have something in common. Jeanette returned her fallen bug type. Now who will the red trainer choose to take on Tauros? The announcer asked. While this is young Ketchum's first league, he is showing he can handle himself against Ms. Fisher, who competed in the Silver Conference last year. Ash frowned. The Silver Conference is Johto's regional league so she clearly has more experience, but it makes sense since she is from a critique city. Whatever, it doesn't matter how much experience she has. He has proven himself against other experienced trainers so he can make it here as well. This next one will cut you down to size. Scyther. Go. Jeanette released her bug flying type. Although Ash has practiced against Gary's Scyther, he still decided to scan it for any last minute information. Scyther. The Mantis Pokemon. Moves incredibly quickly and shreds its enemy with its razor-sharp scythes. Leaps out of tall grass and slices prey with its scythes. On rare occasions, it flies with its wings. With ninja-like agility and speed, it can create the illusion that there is more than one. And Jeanette has gone with her speedy scyther. The announcer informed. Tauros vs. Scyther. Begin. The ref declared. Ash vs. Jeanette P. 3. Vacuum wave. Jeanette shouted. Scyther started spinning on the spot as a wind vortex appeared around him. Pointing his scythe in Tauros' direction, the fighting type priority attack shot towards the wild bull Pokemon. Ash clenched his fist. This might be a risky play but he believes that Tauros can handle it. Payback. Ash shouted. 
Tauros tensed up as the fighting type attack struck the normal type. Tauros grunted as he absorbed the super effective attack. After a couple of moments, Tauros started charging into the vacuum wave. Slamming into the Mantis Pokemon, he caused double the damage caused by that vacuum wave. Despite both being injured, both returned to their original battle position. Jeanette frowned when she saw her best move used against her, she is going to have to do this the hard way. Wing attack, Jeanette shouted. Scyther extended his wings before flying towards the wild bull Pokemon. Tauros smiled confidently seeing the head-on attack, he loves head-to-head -head battles which comes down to the strongest and this is exactly that. Iron head, Ash shouted. Like before, Tauros shot forward as his head was coated in metal. Ash was confident that Tauros would be able to handle this power match thanks to sheer force. He was surprised when the two Pokemon collided and for a couple of moments Scyther seemed to hold his own before both withdrew, looks like he has Technician to counter Tauros' hidden ability. Things just got harder. Double team. Jeanette shouted. She can tell that these two are pretty evenly matched thanks to sheer force and technician respectively. Scyther began to vibrate before two more Scythers appeared and the three stood all in a line. Ash frowned as this is one of the most annoying moves there is. Now use Fury Cutter. Jeanette hollered. All of you. The middle Scyther shot straight forward while the other two Scythers shot of and did curves in the air so they were coming at him from three sides. Ash had a plan for dealing with all three but he just had to wait. Wait for my word Tauros. Ash instructed. Tauros nodded and entered a battle stance as his eye line focused on the three targets. Normally he would like to charge in head first but Ash has proven himself to be pretty smart so the battle veteran is happy to follow his trainer's lead. Ash made his move a split second before the three Pokemon hit the normal type. Wild charge. Ash shouted. Tauros let out a battle cry as an electric field surrounded his body. Ash hated to use a move like this because it would also damage Tauros but this is one of Tauros' only moves with a big enough area of effect to deal with the trio. The two Scythers from the side turned out to be copies and disappeared when the electricity hit them. The front Scyther took damage as he tried to cut the attack. Tauros charged forward with wild charge and Scyther landed on the floor, clearly injured as Tauros took recoil damage. Jeanette clenched her fist. She can risk returning Scyther because of pursuit but he clearly won't last long anyway. Finish it with horn attack. Ash hollered. Ash knew this is Tauros' favorite attack, despite not being the most powerful attack. Tauros charged forward as Scyther struggled to his feet, and the Mantis Pokemon ended up being pushed along by the normal type. Without flinching, Tauros slammed into the wall crushing Scyther between himself and the wall. As he cancelled the attack, Tauros returned to his original position as Scyther slumped onto the floor with swirls in his eyes. Horn marks were left in the wall. Scyther is unable to battle. Meaning this round goes to the green trainer, Ash Ketchum. The ref declared. You're amazing Tauros. Ash praised. He saw that Tauros is clearly tied with panting heavily and sweat covering his face. Do you want to take a rest? You have taken on two Pokemon in a row. Tauros shook his head. Even if he can't beat the third Pokemon he will still put up a good fight to give his team the edge. And that's two Pokemon that Ash's Tauros has took down. He is proving to be a tough bull. The announcer informed. Now will Jeanette's final Pokemon be able to handle this wild bull or will he finally fall? Go Bellsprout! Jeanette shouted, releasing her grass poison type. A Bellsprout! Ash questioned as himself. Pikachu and Tauros all sweat dropped as he scanned the grass poison type. Bellsprout, the flower Pokemon. A carnivorous Pokemon that traps and eats bugs. 
It uses its root feet to soak up needed moisture. Prefers hot and humid places. I don't get it. Why would she use a bell sprout? Serena asked. As herself. Leaf. Misty and Delia all sweat dropped. Looks can be deserving Serena. You've seen Ash overcome the odds with the right moves, and you have yourself. Brock explained thoughtfully. I'm sure an experienced trainer like Jeanette wouldn't use Bellsprout unless it was strong. This is the Indigo League after all. So, you're saying Ash could be in trouble? Leaf questioned. Well not many people would be scared by a little Pikachu. Brock replied. I just hope Ash doesn't let his guard down or it could cost him. All right Tauros, let's keep our guard up. Ash told his normal type. It might not seem like much, but you're clearly hurt and I'm sure Jeanette is some sort of strategy. Tauros vs Bellsprout. Begin. The ref declared. Ash vs Jeanette P. I V. All right Tauros, start off with horn attack. Ash instructed. Tauros nodded and like before started charging towards the flower Pokemon. Jeanette smirked at the head-on attack while Bellsprout just stared at the incoming wild bull with a blank expression on his face. Jump and use Vine Whip. Jeanette smirked triumphantly. Ash was expecting the grass poison type to use the vines to jump just like how Ivysaur would before he evolved. To Ash's surprise, Bellsprout bent down before jumping into the air like a spring would. As he flew over the charging normal type, the flower Pokemon unleashed two vines which wrapped around Tauros' horns. Bellsprout landed behind Tauros and overpowered the wild bull, causing it to fall on his side. It was hard to tell if Bellsprout really was stronger or because Tauros is tired from his two previous battles. Razor Leaf. Jeanette hollered. Bellsprout swiftly retracted his vines as he turned to the normal type. Tauros was struggling to his feet as he was feeling the weight from his previous battles hit him, the flower Pokemon swung his leaves around which sent two sharp leaves towards Tauros. Striking him in the back, Tauros fell back down from the attack. Tauros! Use rage! Ash shouted. Tauros roared as he jumped back to his feet looking really angry. Charging around the field, Tauros picked up speed as he turned towards Bellsprout. He charged at the grass poison type, but again Jeanette smirked. Sweet scent. Jeanette instructed calmly. Bellsprout waved his leaves which unleashed a nice smelling scent. As the scent hit Tauros' nose, the wild bull Pokemon calmed down and came to a complete stop right in front of Bellsprout. Ash clenched his fist. Slam. Jeanette hollered. Bellsprout unleashed two vines and swung them around picking up momentum. Hitting Tauros in the side, the normal type was sent flying as he was unable to tank the attack. Tauros crashed into the ground as he skidded to a stop but he had swirls in his eyes and didn't try to push himself up. Looks like he finally reached his limits. Tauros is unable to battle. Meaning this round goes to the red trainer, Jeanette Fisher. The ref declared. Return Tauros, you were amazing out there. Ash told his fallen normal type as he returned the wild bull Pokemon. And Ash's tough Tauros finally falls. The announcer informed. Can young Ketchum's final Pokemon beat Bellsprout or will he be rooted out of the tournament? Ash quickly swapped his Safari Ball with a regular Pokeball. He is sure that his final Pokemon can handle this Bellsprout. I choose you, Muck. Ash released his Poison type. Upon landing on the grassy field, Muck's toxins dissolved the nearby grass as he extended his body to try and appear intimidating. Jeanette looked slightly worried at her new opponent. Muck vs Bellsprout. Begin. The ref declared. Ash vs. Jeanette P. V. Acid armor. Ash shouted. Muck nodded before trying to dissolve into the field as lights appeared around him showing his physical defense was increased. 
Jeanette clenched her fist as that is normally a muck's weak spot. Get in close, and use knock off. Jeanette shouted. Bellsprout, still with the blank expression on his face wobbled forward towards Muck. Turns out that when not jumping, the flower Pokemon isn't that fast. When close enough, Bellsprout unleashed two vines and started hitting Muck which would have knocked off a held item if he held one. Sludge wave. Ash hollered. With Bellsprout so close, he couldn't dodge. Muck opened his mouth and a long stream of toxic sludge flowed out. Bellsprout took the attack head on and was washed away as the sludge wave caused some serious damage and also destroyed the grass on the battlefield. Hang tough Bellsprout, Jeanette shouted, and show them your moves. Bellsprout nodded and narrowed his eyes. Jumping out of the sludge wave, he landed in front of the sludge Pokemon and started to use some sort of karate moves on Muck, although each slash kick and slice just seemed to bounce off him. Ash smiled, if Bellsprout wants to use unconventional tactics then so can Muck. Muck, Ash shouted, give him a hug. Muck smiled brightly at the instruction. Although he has no problems with battling, he is a lover not a fighter. Extending his arms and slivering over to the flower Pokemon, he ended up crushing Bellsprout as he tried to punch Muck off him. Unfortunately, Muck couldn't and soon the movement stopped. Muck got off him to find the grass poison type lying on the ground with swirls in his eyes. Bellsprout is unable to battle. Meaning both this round and match goes to the green trainer, Ash Ketchum and he will be part of the top 8 trainers advancing to the plateau stages. The ref declared. With the match over, Ash and his friends sent Ash's three Pokemon to Nurse Joy as they got ready for the match between Drake and Gary to see which of the two pallet boys will be in the top 8 along with Ash, Richie, Calum and Paul, who have all already made it. Chapter 56. Indigo League, the Top 8. Walking around the plateau with Pikachu and Togepi, Ash was finally able to give the league location a good look over. Of course, he has seen it every day but this is the first time he has been able to properly look around. The reason he is alone is quite simple really, Togepi has wanted to spend some quality time with his daddy since he hasn't had the chance with Ash having his league battles and needing to prepare for the next one. Ash just won his fourth round match on the grass field against Jeanette Fisher. Although that means he made it into the top eight, tomorrow is a day off for the eight trainers to prepare for the Indigo Stadium, but each trainer will have an interview for them to get to know the trainers, so Ash decided today would be the best place time to spend with Togepi. Toge Toge. Togepi chirped happily. Ash smiled at the baby Pokemon in his hands as he looked at baby fairy type in his hands. Following the young Pokemon's eye line he found him looking at one of the attractions, a game called, Hook a Psyduck. He he he, sorry Togepi but you're a little small for that game. Ash apologies, with a light chuckle. Togepi then had his stomach growl, which made both Ash and Pikachu laugh. I think someone might be hungry. Togepi smiled and nodded hastily. He was getting hungry and wanted something to eat. Ash smiled and found a bench. Sitting on the bench, Ash put Togepi on the seat next to him while he searched through his bag. Getting out a bowl, spoon and banana, Ash mashed the fruit up before looking towards the little fairy type. Who disappeared? Togepi. Ash shouted as he stood up. Over there. Pikachu sighed as he lay on the floor, pointing in a direction. Ash saw the little Mon stood in front of a red stall, which was selling sweets. Ash sighed in relief as he made his way over to him and picked the fairy type up. I've told you Togepi, don't wander off. Ash told his little Mon. The spike ball Pokemon jumped up and down in his daddy's hands, happily. Dada, Dada, 
Togepi chirped as he pointed to the stall. Ash was shocked. His dad said it would be any time now that Togepi would start using proper words, for those who can understand Pokemon, but Ash didn't expect it to happen at the league. And not for him to try and call Ash dad or some variation, although guess that just proves Professor Oak was right when he said Togepi imprinted himself onto Ash. Togepi. Did you just? Ash asked. Shocked. Pre. Togepi cheered. Okay. How come he's gone back to only saying his name? Surely Ash didn't just make up Togepi's speech in his head. URG. He will need to run this past his dad when he gets the chance. Here you go son. The shopkeeper addressed Ash. Ash turned to see the nearly 40-year-old with a 5 o'clock shadow handing him a chocolate coin with the Indigo League symbol imprinted on it. For the little one, my son has become a sort of fan of yours so consider this a gift from him. Oh um, thank you sir. Ash replied, nervously. Taking the chocolate coin, he handed it to the little fairy type who immediately started to chow down on it. Ha ha ha. Don't mention it. The man laughed. Ash decided to make his way back to Pikachu, making sure not to let Togepi out of his sight again. Ash smiled at his young fairy type who was making a mess with the chocolate coin, before he turned to his starter. Hey Pikachu, you'll never guess what. Ash told his electric type, trying to mask his excitement. What? Pikachu asked, genuinely curious. He frowned when he saw the young fairy type with chocolate, while ketchup may be his favorite he still has a sweet tooth for that sort of stuff. And where's mine? He he he, sorry buddy but the guy gave it to Togepi for free. How about I get you some extra ketchup at tea tonight? Ash laughed nervously, although slightly annoyed the electric mouse was happy to accept this offer. Now. Togepi just tried to say his first word. Really? Pikachu asked with a sweat drop a raised eyebrow. A quick glance down to the fairy type shows he has almost demolished the chocolate coin although it's hard to tell if he got more on his face or in his stomach. Togepi doesn't look any different, which makes Ash's story so much harder to believe. Go on then Togepi, let it rip. Toge. Togepi quested his uncle Pikachu after swallowing the last bit of chocolate. Serious Pikachu, he was saying Dada. Ash replied. Pikachu just stared at him in disbelief, as Ash pulled out a wet cloth and cleaned the young Pokemon up. Both Pokemon and trainer were watching to see if Togepi would say anything of the sort. Pre. Togepi chirped before hugging his daddy. Ash sweat dropped. He knows Togepi just tried saying Dada so why isn't he saying it now? Ash soon met up with the group of Serena, Delia, Red, Misty, Brock, Leaf and Professor Oak. The group was going to watch the match between Drake and Gary on the Rock Stadium, which is the last field match. Ash was told that he had to watch the match in the locker room as he was part of the top eight and needed to go straight to the field as soon as the match was over. Although he was watching it with the other six members who made it past the field round, those being Calum, Richie, Paul, and three girls who he didn't recognize, but Ash knew that if they made it this far then they must be good. Togepi decided to stay with Ash since he wasn't actually battling and if Uncle Pikachu could stay with his daddy then so could he. Soon both trainers were in the stands with Gary on the green side and Drake on the red side with the same rock field Ash previously battle on in between, although any damage caused in the other matches were non-existent. The ref also took his place. Now folks you're in for a treat. This battle is between two boys of the same age and same hometown. The announcer informed. Gary Oak is proving to live up to his last name with his display of powerful Pokemon. 
Although Drake Ketchum has used a series of switching and strategy and hasn't lost a single Pokemon yet. This is a final round match between Gary and Drake Ketchum will take place on the rock field to discover the final trainer moving on to the top 8. The ref declared, each trainer will be allowed the use of 3 Pokemon, and can substitute at any time. No time limit is in play and the trainer who shall go first will be. The board with both trainers faces on light up. The green light behind Gary and the red light behind Drake continued flashing, rotating between the two photos, eventually it stopped with Gary's picture lit up. Gary Oak. The ref continued. The battle will be over when all three Pokemon on one side is unable to battle. Gary was mentally cursing his luck, he knows Drake is arguably the smartest competitor here so he needs every advantage he can get and it would help if Drake chose first. Well, might as well start with the field advantage. Let's go Nidoking. Gary shouted as he released one of his strongest Pokemon. Drake stared down his opponent as he seemed to analyze it just from sight alone, while he is clearly a strong Pokemon, he is more physical. While Drake knows his Starmie would run rings around it, he doesn't want this to turn into a constant switch of feelings so he will choose a Pokemon who can match this one with equal physical strength, if not greater. Go Machamp! Drake shouted as he released his fighting type. While Nidoking released a loud roar to show off his power, Machamp remained silent like his trainer and just narrowed his eyes onto his target. Drake hasn't faced Gary's Nidoking but has seen Ash battle it and has also studied Gary's previous league battles prior to this match, so he can easily guess how it will start. Why would Drake go for Machamp when poison types resist fighting? Leaf asked, concerned. I wouldn't worry too much about Drake. Red chuckled lightly. Unlike Ash who relies on his Pokemon's inner strength and comes up with moves on the fly. Drake is much more tactical. He spent this morning watching Gary's previous battles. I'm sure he knows what he is doing. So, you think Drake will win? Serena asked. Well, he is my son, so I am definitely supporting him. Red replied. But no battle is 100% guaranteed until the ref makes his call. All I'm saying is, I am sure Drake has his reasoning for choosing Machamp. And this first round of the final field match is going to be an all-out power battle between these two brutes. The announcer informed as the crowd cheered. Delia also used the opportunity to take a photo as both Pokemon entered a battle stance. Nidoking vs Machamp. Begin. The ref declared. Gary vs Drake P. I. Stone Edge. Nidoking. Gary shouted as soon as the match begun. Nidoking roared as sharp rocks began to circle around him. Drake narrowed his eyes as he watched the ground poison type very carefully. He knows for a fact that these will be dead on even if Machamp tried to dodge, so he will have to work around that. Lucky. He has gotten accustomed to Machamp's no guard ability. With a mighty roar. The rocks started flying towards Machamp. Close combat those rocks. Drake instructed. Without missing a beat, Machamp waited for the rocks to get close enough and started clenched all four of his fists. With pinpoint accuracy, Machamp swiftly hit every single stone edge with one of his fists rendering the attack completely useless. Sludge wave. Gary shouted, angry. He doesn't like the fact that Drake easily and calmly countered his attack and needs to get the upper hand. In his previous battles, Gary did that by overpowering and overwhelming his opponents. Nidoking roared as a large amount of toxic sludge prepared to be released over the field. Earthquake. Drake countered, without missing a beat. Lifting his foot into the air. Machamp slammed it back down onto the field causing the entire stadium to shake. Nidoking seemed to take the brunt of the attack as he was knocked off balance and had the sludge wave cancelled moments before it could be released. 
Gary clenched his fist as he saw Drake take the upper hand. Nidaking, use double edge. Gary shouted as Nidaking tried to stand up, panting from the previous attack. Nidaking was on one knee when he heard his next command and nodded to his trainer's instruction. If he can't attack from far away then he will attack close up. The poison ground type started running, slowly picking up speed and momentum with each stomp getting closer to the fighting type. Stop it! Drake shouted. Machamp braced himself as the drill Pokemon closed in. With fast reactions, Machamp grabbed his horn. Despite being pushed back slightly Machamp quickly brought both Pokemon to a stop overpowering Gary's Nidoking. Seismic Toss Lifting Nidoking above his head using all four of his arms, Machamp slightly bent his legs before jumping high into the air. Once they reached the maximum height, Machamp turned them around and they started to fall towards the ground. Machamp landed on top of Nidoking who had swirls in his eyes. Nidoking is unable to battle. This round goes to the red trainer, Drake Ketchum. The ref declared. Gary sadly returned his poison ground type, without a single word. What did he do wrong? Normally his Nidoking can handle the first Pokemon with easy or even the first two Pokemon, but he just went down easily when he actually had the type advantage. Gary, you like to show off with a power demonstration to overwhelm your opponents. Drake answered the unasked question. But your mistake came from your Nidoking's power balance, he clearly has his strength in his legs. I took that away with Earthquake but you charged straight in before he could recover. Gary frowned as Drake's words sunk in, so that is what he did wrong and Drake was able to easily see his plan. Knowing Drake, he probably saw all of his previous battles and knows he would normally fight back with his Arcanine as his second Pokemon. Well, he won't fall for that old trick. And after winning the first round, Ketchum is educating his opponent in the mistakes he made. The announcer informed. What could the red trainer be thinking? Has he just grown arrogant or is he playing a much larger game like in his previous battles? What could Drake be thinking? Leaf asked. This isn't good Gary, Leaf. Professor Oak replied. Drake is messing with his mind. What do you mean? Serena asked. I think I know. Red replied, with a knowing smirk. The human brain is complex. Even when not focusing on a problem the brain is still trying to figure out a solution, which means a trainer is unlikely to fall for the same trick twice in a battle. Even when they don't fully understand the problem. Which means? Leaf asked confused. By pointing out where Gary made his mistake means Gary will be actively trying to avoid doing it again. Professor Oak explained. Which won't make much difference because like Red explained, he wasn't likely to do that anyway but it means Gary will be preoccupied and more likely to make another mistake. So, you're saying, Drake is using reverse psychology? Brock asked. A version of it. Professor Oak answered, but he is more so guaranteeing his next victory, then the battle becomes three on one. Regardless of Gary's next choice. Go Scyther. Gary shouted as he released his Mantis Pokemon. Since he needs to deal with Machamp, he is going with the type advantage and is also throwing a curve ball by not using his usual Arcanine. Return Machamp. Drake quickly returned his fighting type, swapping his two Pokeballs without a second thought, showing he has full confidence in his next Pokemon to face Gary's bug flying type. Go Pinsir. Gary raised an eyebrow. He is going for a bug on bug battle. Well, he clearly has the advantage since Scyther is part flying type. Drake also smirked. Looks like Gary is falling for the safe sense of security because of the type advantage Drake gave him. Looks like this has turned into a battle of the bugs as Gary uses speedy Scyther while Drake is going with his powerhouse Pinsir. 
the announcer informed. But will Ketchum be able to join his brother in the top eight? Or will Oak follow his father's footsteps? Scyther vs. Pinsier. Begin. The ref declared. Gary vs. Drake P. 2. Quick attack. Gary shouted. Just like Drake knew he would, while he might not use his Arcanine his second Pokemon keeps up the momentum by switching from power to speed. Gary's bug flying type shot into the sky before redirecting towards Pinsir with incredible speed. Drake didn't even blink and neither did Pinsir. Vital throw. Drake replied, calmly. As Scyther closed in, Pinsir quickly grabbed Scyther's scythe moments before he landed the quick attack and easily overpowered the Mantis Pokemon, throwing him into a nearby rock. Gary clenched his fist and Scyther weakly floated back to his original position, looks like one of his wings is damaged from the impact. Well, if you can't fly then land and use X scissor. Gary shouted. And there he goes, when things turn against him he is quick to react just like when they were kids and Ash would win one of their little competitions. As Scyther began running towards the stag beetle Pokemon, he powered up an X scissor attack, Drake smirked as Gary does exactly as he should. Rock Tomb. Drake replied. The eldest twin is remaining calm on purpose as it is just throwing fuel onto Gary's fire, which just makes his decisions less logical. Pinsir let out a battle cry and several rocks started flying over the field. While some missed, Others hit and lowered Scyther's speed as well as causing heavy damage. When the Mantis Pokemon finally reached Pinsir, the pure bug type easily dodged the X Scissor attack by stepping aside and using his foot to trip Scyther up. Guillotine. Drake replied, with a victorious smirk. With Scyther on the ground right in front of Pinsir, both Drake and Gary knew this next move is guaranteed to hit. Bending down to his fellow bug type, Pinsir grabbed the Mantis Pokemon with his pincers. Lifting Gary's Pokemon into the air, Scyther waited with fear for the guaranteed co. With one swift action, Pinsir tightened the grip around Scyther, using the one-hit K. Oh. Move. Waiting five seconds, Pinsir carefully lay the Mantis Pokemon on the ground, with swirls in his eyes. Scyther is unable to battle. Meaning this round goes to the red trainer, Drake Ketchum. The ref declared. And he's done it. Just like his three previous battles Drake Ketchum is two for two and is the only competitor this year to not have lost a single Pokemon in the field matches. The announcer informed. Now can Gary Oak make a comeback or does Drake already have this victory locked down? Return Pinsir. Drake recalled his stag beetle as Gary silently recalled his scyther. Both trainers switched their pokeballs but Drake was quicker and more confident. Go Jolteon. The electric type evolution appeared on the battlefield, and growled threateningly as he crouched into a battle stance, unlike Drake's previous two Pokemon who seemed immobile until he gave them a command. Drake already knows Gary is going with his Blastoise, seeing as it is his starter and by far his strongest team member. He has no doubts about that and by choosing his Pokemon first Drake can get inside the Oak Boy's head yet again. This isn't a Pokemon battle, it is a mind battle and Drake knows he will win. Gary clenched his fist as he held his Blastoise's Pokeball. Either Drake got very lucky or he already knew who Gary was going to choose. Oh, who is he kidding? Drake has known every move of Gary's since this match started and to make matters worse he is losing to his biggest competitor for Leaf. Where the hell did that come from? Gary mentally screamed at himself. He can't think about this now. Even if he has a less than 1% chance of winning he can't give up. As much as he hates to admit it, he is a lot like Ash. Go Blastoise. Gary's water starter appeared on the battle with a massive battle cry. A quick glance at the scoreboard tells the turtle all he needs to know, 
is that he is his trainer's last chance while Drake still has all three of his Pokemon left. It won't be easy but he has beat three Pokemon on his own before so he can do this now. And Gary Oak has made a risky move by going with a water type whilst his opponent has gone with his Jolteon. The announcer informed. But as we have seen many times here, type advantage isn't everything so maybe Gary can pull of a miracle and still make it into the top 8. Typical Drake. Ash thought as he stared at the screen showing his brother's battle. Togepi is currently asleep in his hands whilst Pikachu is chatting with Sparky, Richie's Pikachu. Calum walked over to the raven-haired boy. You know Ash, people are saying your brother is the mostly likely to win. Calum greeted. Ash looked at his girlfriend's cousin with intrigue. It isn't all that surprising, he is the only trainer so far not to have lost a single Pokemon. Surely you would be the favorite. Ash replied. You did compete in the Kalos League, right? Two years ago, and I lost in the first round. Calum explained, as he looked at the ground. I wasn't in a good place. I recently ran into Miette. We used to run into each other while we traveled over Kalos, and I couldn't tell her how I felt. In the end, we parted on bad terms and I took my frustration out on my Pokemon. Quote dot dot dot. Did you? Ash tried to ask, but didn't know how to ask the question. No, I didn't get physical with them. But I might as well as done. Calum replied, grimly. I was tough. Practically every waking moment I was training them and never spent any really time with them. Because of the pain I was going through, I deflected it onto them. In the end only Chesnot fought by my side and he just couldn't win a three-on-one fight. I ended up forfeiting as my eyes were finally opened by him. What did you do? Ash asked. Well, the girl I loved was gone and I didn't know where while all but one of my Pokemon hated me. Calum replied. I did the only thing I could think to do. I re-traveled Kalos and let my Pokemon go at the places that I caught them, but Chesnot decided to stay. Then I went and worked with Professor Sycamore, Kalos' own version of Professor Oak. After two years, my mum reminded me that Serena would be starting her own journey around about this that time, so me and Chesnot came here to see her and Aunt Grace again, and try to make up for my previous mistakes. Well. You've certainly done that. Ash smiled, trying to cheer his girlfriend's cousin up. You've already made it into the top eight, after all. No Ash, I don't mean my league placement. Calum replied. It wouldn't matter to me if I lost in the first round or made it to the finals. The mistakes I wanted to fix was hurting those who supported me in my Kalos journey. And while I'm really close with my Kanto Pokemon, I realize that no matter how many Pokemon I befriend it will never truly make it up to those in Kalos. And I'm just going to need to live with that. I'm sure they forgive you, Calum. Ash tried to be optimistic. Calum smiled sadly at the palette native. Maybe. I'm not sure though. Calum replied as he looked back to the screen. But part of me doesn't want to be forgiven. If I am, then I'd be likely to do it again. The worst punishment isn't when you're locked up, that allows you to pass the blame like you did nothing wrong. While I feel the regret for how I treated them, I know I will never do it again. If I was forgiven, I know a small voice in the back of my head will tell me it was okay, because they forgave me. Ash. All it takes is one bad day. And you could do something that you will regret for life. Ash was speechless as he listened to the older male explain what he's going through. If he didn't return Serena's feeling or if she didn't feel them when he discovered his feeling, would either of them end up like Calum is now? Thinking back to the Sylph company, while Ash wasn't in control of his body he too wanted to end Giovanni's life after he found out what he did. If his dad didn't stop him, 
Then he could be where Kalem is now. Broken. Blastoise vs. Jolteon. Begin. The ref declared. Gary vs. Drake p. 3. Hydro pump. Gary shouted. He can no longer worry about whether or not Drake predicts his move before he makes it. He needs to win and using power has worked in all his other matches so it must work here. The water type aimed his cannons before firing a massive jet of water out of each of them towards the evolution. Dodge with quick attack. Drake instructed. Calmly. Like a bullet. Jolteon shot off from his current position easily dodging the water type attack. Blastoise didn't need to hear his trainer's voice to know what was needed, redirecting his cannons, the hydro pump continued to blast out towards the electric type, although never mang to hit the speedy Pokemon. Gary smiled, if nothing else he will tire Jolteon out from all the running around. Up and over, Drake added. Jolteon nodded as he continued to run and dodge his opponent's hydro pump. Speeding up his quick attack, Jolteon turned and ran straight towards Blastoise. As he saw the two jets of water zooming towards him, Jolteon jumped in the air and spun over Blastoise's head. Effectively dodging the water type attack, Jolteon ended up behind Blastoise. Keep it up, Blastoise. Gary encouraged. The turtle had his cannons follow Jolteon's movements which meant the water shot high into the air before it came like rain. Gary looked confused. Drake never makes a move unless it is needed so what is Drake planning? I need to thank you, Gary. You just finished setting up everything Jolteon needs to win. Drake replied with a confident smirk. Thunder. Jolteon's body sparked a few times but instead of blasting the electricity out of his body in a bolt of lightning, he directed it through his paw. Gary looked in horror as the entire battle became filled with electricity and it was quickly jumping towards his starter. Hide in your shell, rapid spin. Gary shouted. Blastoise quickly withdrew into his shell and started spinning. Gary smiled confidently as Blastoise went head-on into the electric terrain as his Blastoise has handled much bigger blasts of electricity with his shell alone. I wouldn't be so confident Gary, the reason the electricity is spreading like wildfire is because of the water you provided. Drake called out to his opponent. You also wet your Blastoise through, head to toe. That shell won't be able to protect him because the water coating will allow it to pass right through. Just like Drake predicted, as soon as the first spark of electricity hit the spinning water type, he was brought to a complete stop. The rest of the electricity jumped towards him like he is some sort of conductor, forcing Blastoise out of his shell. Crying in pain, Blastoise became the center of a massive lightning bolt which shot into the sky. When it faded, Blastoise fell on his back covered in soot with swirls in his eyes. Blastoise is unable to battle. With all three of his Pokemon down, it means Red Trainer Drake Ketchum is the final member making it into the top eight. The ref declared as the crowd cheered. And he's done it. Red Trainer. Drake Ketchum has made it to the top eight. The announcer informed as the crowd cheered. Now please remain seated as we change the field and bring out the seven other competitors. Return Jolteon. Drake recalled his evolution. Placing the ball on his belt, he looked at Gary as he silently returned his water starter. Drake frowned when he saw the hint of tears in the boy's eyes. Gary has never been the emotion sort and it was just a battle. If Drake lost, he wouldn't cry so neither should Gary. Both trainers climbed down off their stands as the rock field was lowered and replaced with a plain battle field. Drake stood where the ref motioned him to stand as they waited for the seven other trainers. Gary had to pass straight past him. And instead of showing any sportsmanship, Gary walked past him with his head down, not looking Drake in the eyes. While he isn't the best at reading people, 
Drake has a sneaky suspicion that this was more than just a league battle, to Gary at least. Yes, Drake did it. Leaf cheered, louder than anyone in the group. Realizing her outburst, she sheepishly blushed and lightly chuckled as she sat down hoping not to draw any more attention to herself. You sure seem happy about Drake's victory. Delia commented, with a hidden smirk. Maybe it's because Leaf has a crush. Serena teased, after the years of Leaf teasing her about her crush on Ash, she can finally return the favor and she is going to milk this for everything that it is worth. I thought you was the one who had the crush on my son. Red replied bluntly, addressing Serena. Leaf always seemed more like his sister. Much like Drake, Red isn't the best when it comes to people. In his line of work, he hardly gets to meet people. Especially not nice ones, so he has become quite blunt over the years. Serena turned bright red as well, and sat down. Since she was sat next to Leaf it was quite funny to see the two girls in the same flustered curled up state. Serena suddenly thought of something, if Leaf did get with Drake then wouldn't that make them sisters-in-law, in a way. Serena means Leaf has a crush on Drake, honey. Delia explained with a light giggle as she hugged her husband. Red final realized and had a look of understanding cross his face. He has been with his family since Sylph Company because Blue told him about Giovanni's escape and while he doesn't want to worry his family he would like to find some sort of protection program for his wife. His sons are a little different because they will be journeying again and constantly on the move. He has already decided to stay in contact more often and have given both his sons his number, not only to hopefully rebuild their relationship while he's away but also to help Ash now that his aura has awoken. He would just feel safer if his wife had a Pokemon of her own though, seeing as one of his would probably destroy the house and garden with their training routine he would be happy to leave even one of their son's Pokemon seeing as they don't need to be very battled experience and just need to get her to safety if needed, maybe a flying or psychic type would do the job but he can't just expect them to hand one over, it wouldn't be fair. Gary Shore seemed upset. Misty commented as they watched the Oak Boy leave with his head low. Hum, you're right about that. Professor Oak replied. I could be because of his loss in the league, but I doubt it is that simple. He knows Drake was likely to be his biggest competition but it might run deeper than that. What do you mean, Professor? Brock asked. The elderly professor took a quick glance at the two girls to ensure Leaf wouldn't hear what he is about to say. His grandson would never forgive him if he blurted out for him. I believe Gary might have a crush of his own, and learning about Leafs confirmed my suspicions. The professor whispered discreetly, I believe my grandson has had a crush on Leaf ever since they were captured by Team Rocket together, and if Gary noticed that Leaf has one on Drake then that would make Drake his biggest rival. This battle was for more than just a placement in the top eight, wherever Drake knows it or not. Of course, Gary wouldn't admit it even if it is true, especially after this defeat. Soon the seven other trainers walked out of the locker room and the final eight stood on the battlefield. The eight are Ash, Drake, Calum, Richie, Paul, and three unknown females. Due to it being near the end of the day, the stars were out. A spotlight moved over to the other locker room and six figures walked out, with five Pokemon. Those people are Lorelei, with her Lapras by her side. Bruno, with his Machamp by his side. Agatha, with her Gengar by her side. Lance, with his Dragonite by his side. Blue, with his Blastoise by his side, even with a weird arm brace on with some sort of stone in the middle of it, and leading the elite foreign champion as President Goodshow. The new arrivals stood in front of the top eight while the crowd cheered. Goodshow had a microphone and was clearly waiting to speak. 
Soon the crowd did go quiet. Well trainers, you are here because you've proven to be a step above the rest and made it through the group stages into the top eight. Well done. Charles Goodshow congratulate. The crowd applauded the eight trainers. But now the competition will only get harder. All battles will take place in the Indigo Stadium and have turned into full battles. As you are not restricted by a carry limit whilst competing, you are required to registrar your six Pokemon beforehand. Also, if any battles end as a tie then both of you will be knocked out so you can't leave anything to chance. The top eight nodded in understanding, although Ash couldn't help but sweat a little. The competition is really stepping up, not only because the battles are six on six but because they have to win. In the field stages if you tied each trainer could chose a fourth Pokemon and go into a sudden death round where the first to land an attack would win but now no body has that safety net. If you look to the screen, you will see who your opponent is and what time your battle shall take place. Charles continued. Remember tomorrow is a resting day for the trainers to prepare and each trainer will take part in an interview so you can get to know them better. If you're watching at home, you can call in to ask your questions so don't feel left out. Ash sweat dropped as the president turned into a sort of show host, just being reminded that it is televised makes this all the more nerve-wracking. Looking towards the screen, Ash was shocked to find his match was the first of the day, 9 a.m. and it was against none other than... Dot dot. Richie. Ash knows he would have to face his friends and brother at some point if he was going to win but he didn't expect it to be so soon. The next round started at noon and was between two of the female trainers. The third match started at three in the afternoon and was Calum against the other female trainer whose name is, Asunta Cyan. That only left two competitors left. The final round started at seven and was Drake vs Paul. Once they were able to take in all the information, the top eight were allowed to leave and as they did each member of the Elite Four and Champion greeted them, although Ash and Drake have known Blue for years, he remained completely profession just like the Elite Four. They can't imagine how painful it must have been for him to see his son lose at his final hurdle and then have to wish the trainer who beat his son luck in his upcoming battles. Once Ash, Drake, Calum and Richie were outside they were met with the pallet crew of Professor Oak, Delia, Red, Serena, Leaf, Misty and Brock. Serena approached her boyfriend and gave him a small hug from the side, careful not to wake the sleeping Togepi. Ash smiled and was going to say something when Leaf surprised everyone and jumped forward excitedly hugging Drake. Ash's brother didn't know how to respond and sweat dropped with a freaked out expression. Air. Ash help. Drake nervously requested. Unlike Serena who was always shy around Ash, Leaf is still true to her hyperactive bubbly attitude and acted on impulse, no matter what that makes her look like in front of Drake. Congratulations on winning. Leaf praised as she jumped up and down excited. Due to her still hugging the raven-haired boy, Drake was forced to jump with her much to his embarrassment and confusion. Gary. Professor Oak spoke, causing Leaf to let go of Drake much to the boy's relief and everyone turned to face him. I'm sorry about how your battle ended, Gary. Ash spoke up stepping up to his rival. Gary smiled sadly. Even after the years of tournament he put Ash through he would consider him to be his closest friend. Hey hey. Thanks Ash. Gary replied before turning around. But you probably want to go and celebrate, right? I bet Richie and Calum are doing the same thing. You should even take Serena out. I bet she would like that. Ash looked even more confused. Sure it was Gary who helped him back on the saint. And all that time ago and who got Ash to slow dance with Serena but this doesn't sound like him. Although, now that he thinks about it another date does sound like a good idea, but the only problem is Togepi. 
Well, I guess I'll be seeing ya. Gary replied, quickly. He isn't one for long goodbyes and honestly would have preferred to just sneak off beforehand, but he knows that would be mean and his dad and granddad would problem send a search party after him. You're lucky Drake. Now Drake is really confused, not only is Leaf acting all strange but Gary is too and why call him lucky. That battle had nothing to do with lucky. It wasn't like they were even throughout and he only took the lead because of a random critical. Serena, on the other hand knew exactly why Gary said that. Looks like her theory about the Oak Boys feeling are true and seeing Leaf practically jump into Drake's arms couldn't have been easy. She can remember how she would feel if Ash showed any sort of affection to anyone else before they got together, Pokemon not included. Gary. You're leaving already? Ash asked, shocked. A quick glance at Leaf's face shows she is just as shocked by this revaluation. Yeah, now that I am out of the league, I really don't belong here. Gary replied with a sheepish chuckle in hopes to lighten the mood. Don't be stupid Gary, me and Serena haven't competed but we are her to cheer on our friends. And you have just as much right to. Leaf tried to retort but was cut off. Save it, Leaf. We both know who you were supporting in that last battle. Gary replied with anger in his voice. You should just go and enjoy your time here. I'm sure Drake will keep you company. I'm going off, and you can't stop me. Where are you going, Gary? The elderly professor asked. I need to get stronger, Grandpa. Gary replied. This shocked the Pokemon professor as Gary has always referred to him as Gramps. Don't worry, I'll stay in touch. I'm going to need to rotate my Pokemon after all. Without another word, Gary walked away not wanting to hear another word. Unknown to everyone else, he had a single tear run down his face. He wasn't lying he has to go because he isn't strong enough not just with his Pokemon but also with himself. He has been considering it while the top eight were in the Rock Stadium and when he saw Leaf hug Drake he knew he was already in a losing battle. He will come back, when he is stronger and knows he can face her again. In all honesty, he wishes the best for both Leaf and Drake, but also is making a promise to help Leaf, if Drake ever hurts her. The next morning, Ash, Drake, Calum and Richie were picked up from the Pokemon Center early on to get them ready for their interviews. It was explained that they would be shown one at a time and the interviewer would ask them a series of questions before the audience have a Q&A. Calum already went for his interview and Ash was told he would be the second on the stage. Back at the Pokemon, the adults were sat on one table discussing Gary's departure and Professor Oak decided he would be the one to tell Blue. Leaf and Serena were joined by Miette and they sat in the Pokemon Center lounge watching the TV waiting to see the boys appear on screen. Calum just left the show and it cut to advertisements. Wow. Calum sure seemed to own the stage. Leaf commented. He didn't even seem a little bit nervous. Of course not, he has always been one calm under pressure. Miette informed. So, while we wait, when are you going to make your move on Drake? Leaf blushed madly at Miette's boldness. Serena couldn't help but giggle since she isn't the one on the end of Miette's antics this time. WH what do you mean? Leaf stuttered hoping playing dense will work. Don't play dumb. That hug was not a just friend's hug. Miette replied, with a triumphant smirk. Leaf entire face turned bright red and looked at the giggle happy Serena with pure anger. Serena tried to stem her laughter to defend herself. Don't look at me, Serena insisted, waving her hands in front of her face. I didn't tell her. Leaf looked at Miette for confirmation. She's right. Serena didn't tell me. Miette admitted. Then how did you know? Leaf asked. I have my ways. 
Miette replied slyly, with a confident expression. Anyway, I was thinking we would leave you two alone tonight and you can make your move. While we take our boys out on a double date. What? Serena and Leaf exclaimed in unison. Oh yeah, me, Calum, you and Ash are all going on a double date tonight to give Leaf and Drake some space to discuss their future together. Miette replied, matter of factly. But, but, Serena stuttered. What if they don't want to? Okay, not the best argument but still. Serena dear, there is one important lesson you need to learn about being a girlfriend. Miette replied with a smirk. Serena's looked at her like what is it then? We're the girlfriends, and that means we make the final decisions. Serena knew arguing with the blue net was pointless and lucky the television brought an end to the current conversation. And we're back. The interview greeted. Now our next guest is the second of our top eight from this year's Indigo League. He has surprised everyone with he out of character Pokemon. Whether it's his rapping haunter, affectionate Gyarados or even his powerhouse of an Aerodactyl. From Pallet Town, it ashes Ketchum. The crowd cheered as Ash walked onto the stage and took his seat. He was holding his Togepi in his hands who was marveling at the crowd and pretty shining lights while Pikachu was perched on Ash's shoulder and waving to them. Soon the cheers quietened. Well, first of congratulation on making it this far. The interview praised. Oh, thank you. Ash replied, bashfully. But it is really my Pokemon who deserves the thanks. Toge Toge. Togepi added his own two pence even if he doesn't understand what they are talking about. And who is this little guy? The interview asked. Many of us recognize your Pikachu from your battle on the ice field, but this little guy is a new one. Togepi got scared as the interview turned his attention to him and jumped onto Ash's lap out of the crowd's sight. He smuggled into Ash's stomach in an attempt to hide. He he he, this Togepi. Ash laughed as he comforted the little fairy type. He hasn't long hatched and sort of imprinted on me. It was hard enough getting him to stay with my friends whilst battling and he wasn't going to leave my side today. Well, he certainly is shy. The interview lightly chuckled. As many females in the crowd awed at the baby Pokemon. One Pokemon of yours who certainly isn't shy is your Gyarados. Many people have wondered how you was able to tame an atrocious Pokemon to the point of being openly affectionate. Well, eh hey hey, I met him back when he was a Magikarp. Ash started. It was pretty early in the journey and we were taking a beach day. While swimming I found him tackling a rock to train, but he was hurting himself. I offered to help and my Pokemon started to train him. As the day went on we a group of Tentacruel came to attack us, and he evolved to protect us. When we were going to part ways, he asked to join the team and we have been together ever since. Well, that is quite the story Ash but now we have to turn to the audience both in the studio today and those watching at home as they too have some questions to ask you. The interview explained. Okay. Ash replied. He is actually surprising himself with how calm he is remaining. Okay, our first call comes from this young lady in the audience. The interview announced as a stage hand passed a mic to a woman in her mid-twenties who had medium-length brown hair. What's your name, dear? Susie. The women replied. And what's your question? The interview asked. You speak like a good guy with your stories about Togepi and your Gyarados. Susie started. But why should we trust you? After all you were so considerate to your opponent on the rock field, Melissa. And you completely embarrassed her in front of everyone. Ash sighed. So that's how long it took for someone to bring up what is by far his worst league experience. Well Ash. The interview asked. The truth is, I hated what I did to Melissa but I wasn't given much choice. Ash admitted, grimly, 
I turned her down because of one simple reason, I already have a girlfriend. If I was to accept the offer, then I would have been cheating as a result. I was in a lose, lose situation. Well, I for one am glad that is cleared up. The interview replied in an upbeat tone, he doesn't like such grim material, it leads to a loss in views. Now we have a caller from Vermilion City, John. Hey, I am a big fan and I just wanted to ask Ash what his plan is for his battles moving forward. John asked. He he he. First off thank you. Ash sheepishly laughed. And as for the question, me and my Pokemon trust each other and it is that trust that will push us forward in the league. We don't give up until it's over. Ash continued to answer more questioned until his time was up. He went back to the Pokemon Center where he met the girls and Calum as the others were at the stadium. On the way back, Ash told Calum to go ahead for one simple reason, he found Melissa sitting on a bench. He hasn't seen her since the end of their battle in the Rock Stadium and now her she is. As much as his brain is telling him to run and to never look back, Ash knows he should do the grown-up thing and talk it out with her. Hey, Ash greeted as he leaned against the back of the bench. Melissa had been looking down and hadn't seen his arrival which was evident by her shocked expression and slight jump when she heard his voice. Ash, Melissa exclaimed, as a hint of pink hit her cheeks. Yeah, it's me, Ash replied, before both went quiet. Melissa looked down as she didn't know where else to look. After nearly two minutes of silence, Ash sighed as it looks like he will need to take the lead. Quote dot dot dot, Melissa. I'm sorry for rejecting you back at the end of our battle. It must have been horrible to go through that in front of everyone. No Ash, I'm sorry. Melissa hastily replied. She quickly looked up at him and didn't want him to feel bad about what happened. If it was the other way around and she already had a boyfriend and was asked out then she would be annoyed, so she won't accept Ash feeling bad. After all, this was all started because of her stupid mistake, maybe it was wishful thinking but she should have noticed that Ash and Serena were a couple, they never tried to hide it after all. You're sorry, Ash questioned, with a confused expression. Clearly not expecting that response, she got rejected after putting herself on the line. Yeah Ash, Melissa replied, looking down to the ground. After I met you, you ran off and defeated Damien, getting my badges back and also saving my golem. I know your Charizard had some unfinished business but, I guess I took those actions to heart. Now it was Ash's turn to blush, it was actually quite humbling to hear those words. He just wanted to do what was right and didn't have any sort of hidden agenda or mean to send but in hindsight he can tell how someone might come to that sort of conclusion after all he fell for Serena because of her actions. Partly. While you battled Damien, I spent the time with your friends Misty and Brock. Dot dot. And Serena as well. Melissa continued. We talked about multiple things but you also came up and looking back, I should have guessed that you and Serena were together just by the way she was speaking. I might have had a crush on you but, she could tell me almost anything about you. From how you met each of your Pokemon, to your favorite meal and so on. If I had just opened my eyes then neither of us would be here. It's okay Melissa, I guess we both made mistakes and just never really talked about any of this. Honestly, I was pretty dense until Serena confessed during our journey and maybe a little bit of that played a part in this. Ash replied, with a nervous chuckle. He he he, Serena mentioned you was pretty oblivious to anything other than Pokemon and food. Needless to say, he was surprised when told he was going on a double date and when he tried to bring up the Togepi issue Miet insisted he brings him along as she wants to get to know the little Mon better. 
Night time rolled around and with the interviews over and the boys registering their teams for the battles tomorrow, the four people and two Pokemon got ready, setting out on their double date. So, where are we going? Ash asked. While he is in his normal traveling clothes they have clearly been ironed and he left his hat behind, combing his hair instead. He did buy some formal clothes for when he and Serena goes on dates but he wasn't expecting to need them at the league and thus left them in Pallet Town. You're the boyfriends, you decide. Miette replied, with her tone it was hard to tell if she was teasing him or being deadly serious. After all, he only found out about this date a few hours ago and neither himself or Calum have had any real time to prepare anything. To say he was nervous is an understatement. Follow my lead. Calum subtly whispered to the younger trainer. Knowing Miette from early on in his Kalo's adventure he guessed that she would try something like this whilst at the league. This is one of his favorite traits she has after all. Ash nodded in understanding as Calum is clearly prepared as he is in proper formal wear. It's a surprise. As they walked Serena wrapped her arms around Ash's while resting her head on his shoulder. While she isn't looking forward to spending the night with Miette where she is sure a lot of teasing is to follow, she can at least enjoy her time with Ash. Admittedly, she wasn't the happiest when Ash told her about his run-in with Melissa but she trusts him completely and just the fact that he told her straight away proves her trust is well placed. Calum lead the group to an all-you-can-eat restaurant which Ash was happy to find out was giving a huge discount for those in the top eight and one guest per participant. They had a pleasant meal, and Serena was even impressed by how hard Ash was trying to eat nicely. Miette and Calum shared stories from their first journey around Kalos while Ash and Serena shared their own stories from Pallet Town. Okay guys. You are the six I've decided to use against Paul in our battle tomorrow. Drake told the six selected Pokemon who were lined up on the battlefield. Unlike Ashes who would normal cheer at such news, Drake's Pokemon remained calm and collected showing little more than a head nod in understanding. Drake split his six Pokemon into three groups of two and gave them instructions to start sparring with each other. He plans to watch Ash's battle tomorrow whilst it is happening but because that is the first match of the day and his is the last, he will use the several hours in between to ensure his selected team is ready. Watching the whole thing from the bench just off the training field is Leaf. Due to it being night time, she has a coat on over her regular attire. The whole reason the other four decided to go on their date is to give her some space to make her move. Unfortunately, Drake hasn't spared her a second glance all night and the most emotion she could get out of the eldest twin was when she jumped on him after his battle. In hindsight, that wasn't a good reaction either. Sighing that this whole opportunity, as Miette described it, was going to waste she decided to at least try and talk to him. Standing from the bench she walked over to the Pokemon trainer. Drake. I'm going inside now. Wanna come with? Leaf asked. Shyly. Was this what it was like for Serena whenever she tried to talk with Ash? Leaf was suddenly feeling quite guilty about all the teasing she put her honey blonde friend through. Can't. I need to make sure I'm ready for tomorrow and since Ash's battle is in the morning I need to utilize this time now efficiently. Drake replied, in a calculated manner. Even though he is trying to make friends now that he and Ash are on good terms, that doesn't mean it will happen overnight. He spent years studying and is an expert when it comes to planning and analysis, of course this is how he would prepare for his battle. Even when selecting his team, he based it around the Pokemon he knows Paul owns, which are Grotal from the Sinnoh region, Electabuzz, Nidoking, Cloyster and Firo. It is too bad that the league website doesn't give away a trainer's full lineup and only those who have competed in the league, 
which in Paul's case he has used the same three Pokemon in each match despite the field change. Since Drake doesn't know a full lineup of six Pokemon and his uncle isn't allowed to divulge the team Paul used to defeat him, trainer confidentiality, he planned for the five he does know Paul has and then picked his sixth Pokemon as his most resilient Pokemon as a result. As much as Drake hates to admit it, he is actually worried to face his biggest rival in the league. Okay. See y'all later then. Leaf sighed in disappointment before slumping back into the warmth into her bed. When Miette talked about how tonight will play out, while Nervous couldn't help but be pulled in by the Bluenet's vision. It couldn't have turned out more different, except she doesn't have anyone around her to talk to since Ash and Serena are on a date. She doesn't really know Misty or Brock and Gary has left. Hell. Gary basically spelt her crush out to Drake and he is just as oblivious. Maybe Drake is like how Ash used to be, guess she would need Serena to tell her about how she broke through his skull. Depressed by the ruined night and her chance to show Drake how she feels, Leaf decided to call it a night and left for her room. All she hopes is that Ash and Serena's night turned out better than hers. Walking back under the night sky, Ash has Serena leaning against them as they walk with her eyes closed with Togepi also asleep on him. Miet learned early on in the night that Togepi isn't one to open up quickly but the mayhem he caused the blue net when she held him brought a smile to almost everyone's face. Serena, you're cold, Ash told his girlfriend. They are walking behind Miet and Calum, who are in a similar position. Ash noticed goose bumps on Serena's arms and due to it being late at night showed she is cold. Serena tried to say she wasn't but it was pointless and Ash took his jacket off, putting it around her shoulders. While Serena hates that now Ash will go cold because of her, she can't help but smile at the fact that Ash is so caring. Then again, that is why she fell for him in the first place. Thank you. Serena whispered with a tiny blush and peck on his cheek before they turned back towards the Pokemon Center. They were surprised to find Calum and Miette were still here, but felt awkward when they found them kissing. Serena decided to capitalize on the moment and looked at Ash expectantly. When Ash noticed Serena looking at him, he sighed before smiling. Of course, he has already kissed her and has no problem with it, but doing it with other people around is something he isn't fond of. At least those two are preoccupied so it won't be too bad. Wrapping his arms around her waist, he turned himself and Serena towards him and pushed his lips into hers. Surprised by the quick reaction, Serena snaked her arms around Ash's neck and deepened the kiss by pulling his head closer. As the two just remained in the embrace just focusing on moment. While both had their doubts about the double date, they can mentally agree that all's well that ends well. To be continued. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you guys like this video. If you do then like and share this video with your friends. And do not forget to subscribe to my channel and also make sure to press the bell icon to get the notification for my new videos. And remember the author's name is Heracross0122, so please go and check out his fanfics page. Now then, goodbye for now, see you guys on my next video.